Jim Prudhoe came to Thursgood School in late May. It was mid-term, and he came without an interview, employed through one of the shiftier agencies, specializing in supplying teachers for prep schools. A linguist, Thursgood told the common room. A temporary measure. Driving an old Alvis and towing a caravan, Jim Prudhoe arrived just after lunch on Friday in the middle of a rainstorm. The rain rolled like gun smoke down the Quantocks, then raced across the empty cricket fields into the sandstone of the crumbling facades. Early afternoons at Thursgoods are a tranquil time. The boys are sent to rest in their dormitories, and the staff sit in the common room over coffee reading newspapers. Of the whole school, therefore, only little Bill Roach actually saw Jim arrive. Roach was a new boy in those days and graded dull. He was an only child from a rich but broken home. And the circumstances of his short life so far had contrived to make him a natural watcher. In Roach's observation, Jim did not stop at the school buildings, but continued across the stable yard and onto the wet grass. He eventually stopped in a depression on a patch of waste ground, which had once been the initial excavation for a school swimming pool that was never built. This depression was known in school folklore as the dip, and it was into this that Roach saw the car with its caravan disappear like a giant rabbit into its hole. When the bell rang for the end of rest, Roach put on his wellingtons and trudged through the rain to the top of the dip. He peered down, and there was Jim dressed in an army raincoat and a quite extraordinary hat, with one side pinned up rakishly and the water running off it like a gutter. Jim was sitting on the step, drinking what Roach thought was water from a beaker, and rubbing his right shoulder as if he had banged it on something. Then the hat lifted, and Roach found himself staring at an extremely fierce red face, crisscrossed with jagged cracks, and made fiercer still by a brown moustache washed into fangs by the rain. His hunched shoulder and the hat made him look lopsided, who the hell are you? asked a very military voice. Sir, Roach, sir, I'm a new boy. For a moment longer, the brick-red face surveyed Roach from the shadow of the hat. Then, to his intense relief, its features relaxed into a wolfish grin. New boy, eh? Got any friends? No, sir, said Roach, simply. When Jim made no reply to this, Roach felt an odd stirring of kinship suddenly and of hope. My other name's Bill, he said. Bill, eh? Good name. Known a lot of Bills. They've all been good uns. With that, in a manner of speaking, the introduction was made. Jim disappeared into the caravan. Roach stepped gingerly down the bank and peered through the doorway. Jim had taken off his hat. His sandy hair was close-cropped and there were patches where someone had gone too low with the scissors. These were mostly on one side, so that Roach guessed that Jim had cut his hair himself with his good arm, which made him look even more lopsided. Come in, said Jim. Careful, though. Floor's not level. Skew whiff, like me. And he rubbed his hunched shoulder again. Roach observed that the floor did tilt rather alarmingly. What are you good at, Bill? I don't know, sir, said Roach, woodenly. Got to be good at something, surely. Everyone is. I don't know, sir, Roach repeated, and moved half a pace towards the open door. This was an unfortunate question to ask of Roach just then, for it occupied most of his waking hours. In work and play, he considered himself seriously inadequate. Even the daily routine of the school, such as making his bed, and tidying his clothes, seemed to be beyond his reach. Most of all, he blamed himself for the breakup of his parents' marriage. So this chance question, leveled at him by a creature at least halfway to divinity, a fellow solitary at that, brought him suddenly 
very close to tears. You're a good watcher anyway, said Jim. Us singles always are. No one else spotted me. Best watcher in the unit, Bill Roaches, I'll bet. Yes, sir, Roach agreed gratefully. I am. Well, you stay here and watch then, Jim commanded. And I'll slip outside and trim the legs. You call out when she tilts. Understand? Yes, sir. During the course of that summer term, Roach's good opinion of Jim came to be held unanimously amongst the boys. Among the rest of the Thursgood community, however, opinion regarding Jim was less unanimous. Something about him made Thursgood himself quite nervous. From his study, he telephoned the employment agency. The proprietor, a Mr. Stroll, asked, What, um, precisely do you want to know? Well, nothing precisely, said Thursgood. Merely that if one asks for a written curriculum vitae, one expects it to be complete. One doesn't like gaps. He's uh, been in hospital, said Mr. Stroll. Laid up, spinal. Uh, quite so, returned Thursgood. But I assume he has not been in hospital for the last 25 years. If you don't fancy him, chuck him out. You ask for temporary and cheap, and that's what you've got. It was obvious that Mr. Stroll was tiring of the conversation. That's as may be, persisted Thursgood, but I'm entitled to certain assurances. It says here, before his injury, various overseas appointments of a commercial nature. Now, that's hardly an enlightening description of a lifetime's work, and I happen to know that he was up at Oxford in 38. Why didn't he finish? I seem to recall there was a war round about then, Stroll replied with heavy sarcasm, and brought the conversation to an end. Well, he's been somewhere, said Thursgood to himself, and he stared across the windswept gardens to the dip. On a cold, wet night, late in the year, George Smiley approached the sanctuary of his Chelsea home, ruefully rehearsing the details of what had been from the start a day of travail. He had risen too late, after working too late the night before, a practice which had crept up on him since his retirement last year. His bank statement, delivered with the morning post, revealed his wife had drawn the lion's share of his monthly pension. As the day wore on, he became irritable and telephoned his solicitor, seeking an appointment for that afternoon. Oh, George, how can you be so vulgar? Nobody divorces Anne. Send her some flowers and come to lunch. Later that afternoon, when the long and indulgent luncheon was over, he had the misfortune to walk slap into the arms of Roddy Martindale. Martindale had no valid claim on Smiley, either professionally or socially. He worked on the fleshy side of the Foreign Office, and his job consisted of lunching visiting dignitaries, whom no one else would have entertained in a woodshed. My dear boy, Martindale exclaimed, if it isn't the maestro himself, I want to know all you've been doing, every little bit. Are you well? How's the delicious Anne? Then his voice dropped to a mountainous murmur. I say, you're not back on the beat, are you? Don't tell me it's all cover, George. Cover? So, fool that he was, Smiley bought his escape, by agreeing to dine that same evening at a club to which they both belonged, but which Smiley avoided like the pest, not least because Roddy Martindale was a member. When evening came, Smiley had listened to his nonsense, saying, yes, and no, and what a pity, and no, they never found him, till with lugubrious inevitability, Martindale came to more recent things, the change of power, and Smiley's withdrawal from the service. Predictably, he started with the last days of control. Your old boss, George, bless him, the only one who ever kept his name a secret. And not from you, of course. He never had any secrets from you, George, did he? Close as thieves Smiley and control were, so they say, right to the end. That's why you were thrown out. That don't deceive me. 
That's why Bill Hayden got your job. That's why he's Percy Allerline's cup-bearer, and you're not. If you say so, Roddy. I do say so, said Martindale, drawing closer. It was the check scandal that finally put the nail in Control's coffin, I suppose. Half listening to Martindale, Smiley thought to himself, and I buried him myself at a hateful crematorium in the East End last Christmas Eve, alone. Martindale was droning on. That poor fellow who was shot in the back and got himself into the newspapers, the one who was so thick with Bill Hayden always, so we hear. Ellis, we're to call him, and we still do, don't we? Even if we know his real name as well as we know our own. <laughs> Martindale waited for Smiley to cap this, but received no answer. He went on. Somehow I can never quite believe in Percy Allerline as chief, can you? Who's his strong left arm, George? Who's earning him his reputation? You're out of my depth, truly, Roddy, insisted Smiley, getting up. But Martindale would not give up. So, who's the clever boots? Not Percy, that's for sure. How about dashing Bill Hayden? Bill, your old rival? I'm told that you and Bill shared everything once upon a time. Or is it bland, hmm? Huh? And if those two aren't providing the speed, then it's someone in retirement, isn't it? Eventually, Smiley was able to make his break. Good night, Roddy. I can't help you, really. Night, George. Love to Anne. And now Smiley walked towards Bywater Street along the King's Road in the pouring rain. Small, podgy, and at best middle-aged. He was, by appearance, one of London's meek, who do not inherit the earth. His legs were short, his gait anything but agile, his dress costly, ill-fitting, and extremely wet. His house in Bywater Street was in darkness, and the curtains were as he'd left them. Since Anne's departure, his cleaning lady also had left. No one but Anne had a key. There were two splinters of oak, each the size of a thumbnail, wedged into the lintel above and below the lock on the front door. There was always the possibility that one day, out of a past so complex that he himself could not remember all the enemies he might have made, one of them would find him and demand a reckoning. With the tips of his fingers, he discovered each splinter of wood in turn. The routine over, he unlocked the door and went inside. His gaze fell upon an unfamiliar umbrella in the stand. Its owner had known about the wedges, and known how to put them back once he was inside the house. A professional like himself, who had at some time worked closely with him, and knew his handwriting, as it is called in the trade. The drawing-room door was ajar. Softly, he pushed it further open. I'd leave that coat on if I were you, George, old boy, said the amiable voice of Peter Willem. We've got a long way to go. Five minutes later, George Smiley was sitting crossly in the passenger seat of Gwillem's extremely drafty sports car. Their destination was Ascot, the residence of Mr. Oliver Lakin of the Cabinet Office senior advisor to various committees, and a watchdog of intelligence affairs. Or, as Gwillem put it less reverentially, Whitehall's head prefect. Twenty minutes later, Smiley had asked a dozen questions, and received no answer worth a penny. And now a nagging fear was waking in him, which he refused to name. I'm surprised they didn't throw you out with the rest of us, Peter, he said, not very pleasantly. You had all the qualifications. Good at your work. Loyal. Discreet. They put me in charge of scalp hunters, replied Gwillem. Oh, my lord, said Smiley with a shudder, and thought of the grim Flint schoolhouse in Brixton that served the scalp hunters as their headquarters. The scalp hunters' official name was Travel. They had been formed by control on Bill Hayden's suggestion. They were a small outfit, about a dozen men, and they handled the hit-and-run jobs that were too dirty or too risky for the residents abroad. In your day, the circus ran itself by regions, Willem explained. Russia, China, Asia, you name it. 
Each region was commanded by its own man, and control sat in heaven and held the strings, remember? It strikes a distant chord, said Smiley, faintly. Well, today, everything operational is under one hat. It's called London Station, and Bill Hayden's in command. Roy Bland's is number two, and Toby Estehazy runs between them like a poodle. They're a service within a service. They share their own secrets and don't mix with the proles. After a pause, Smiley asked in a tentative tone, What's the news of Ellis? He did recover. He can walk. Backs can be terribly tricky, I understand. The word is he manages pretty well. How's Anne? I didn't ask. Fine. Just fine. The rain was easing off as Smiley stepped out of the car onto the gravel drive at Lakin's place. Yes, he thought. It was raining when I came here before, when the name Jim Ellis was headline news. They were shown to the drawing room and were exchanging meaningless pleasantries with Lacon when the doors opened and a tall figure appeared, half in silhouette. The man stepped into the room and the doors were closed behind him by unseen hands. Lock us in, please, Lacon called, and they heard the snap of the key. You know, Mr. Smiley, don't you? Yes, I do, said the figure, walking towards them out of the gloom. You changed my first nappies, didn't you, Mr. Smiley? Tar, sir. Ricky Tar. All of ten or twelve years ago, it had been among Smiley's jobs to vet recruits. No one was taken on without his nod. No one trained without his signature on the schedule. Tar had been one of those raw recruits. Well, uh, I guess I'd better make my pitch, Tar said pleasantly, as he settled his easy body into the chair. It happened around uh, six months ago, he began. April, Willem snapped. Just keep it precise, shall we? All the way along. April, then, Tar said equably. Things were pretty quiet in Brixton. Then out of the blue came this flash requisition from Hong Kong residency. They had a low-grade Soviet trade delegation in town. One of the delegates was stepping wide in the nightclubs, name of Boris, and Mr. Gwillem has all the details. Ignoring Tar, Gwillem said, Southeast Asia was Tar's parish. He was sitting around with nothing to do, so I ordered him to make a site inspection and report back by cable. But Tar said he flew in the next night with an Australian passport describing him as one Mr. Thomas from Adelaide. He took up Boris's trail, and soon he was sure that Boris was a professional. He never knew a Soviet delegation that didn't carry a couple of security guerrillas, whose job it was to keep the boys out of the flesh pots. Boris's visits to nightclubs were obviously rendezvous of some sort. Well, now listen, said Tar. It's one thing to burn a small-time trade delegate. It's quite a different ball game to swing your legs at a Moscow centre-trained hood. Right, Mr. Gwillem? Gwillem said, Since the reorganisation, scalp hunters have no brief to trawl for double agents. They must be turned over to London Station on site. And I've been in double-double games before, Tar confessed in a tone of injured virtue. Believe me, Mr. Smiley, they're a can of worms. I'm sure they are, said Smiley, and gave a prim tug at his spectacles. Tar cabled Gwillem, no sail, and booked a flight home. Since his flight didn't leave till Thursday, he thought that before he left, just to pay his fare, he might as well burgle Boris's hotel room. In a very short time, Tar was standing inside Boris's room, with his back against the door, waiting for his eyes to grow accustomed to the dark. He was still standing there when a woman spoke to him in Russian, drowsily from the bed. It was uh, Boris's wife. She was crying, Tar explained. Look, I'll call her Irina, right? Mr. Gwillem has all the details. Gwillem explained that she was Boris's common-law wife and a member of the delegation in her own right. From the outset of this meeting, Smiley had assumed, for the main, a Buddha-like inscrutability 
from which neither Tar's story nor the rare interjection from Willem could rouse him. He sat, leaning back with his short legs bent, head forward, and plump hands linked across his generous stomach. His hooded eyes had closed behind the thick lenses. His only fidget was to polish his glasses on the silk lining of his tie, and when he did this, his eyes had a soaked, naked look, which was embarrassing to those who caught him at it. Tar went on with his narrative. He took Irina's presence calmly, he said, and bluffed through with his fallback story. And that, said Tar, was how it all began. It was 11.30 when he made Boris's room. He left at 1.30 with a promise of a meeting next night. Tar coloured quaintly and said, When Mr. Thomas from Adelaide came into her life, she was at the end of the line from worrying what to do about the demon Boris. I could scent it, Mr. Smiley. There was gold in her. First thing next morning, I'll cancel my flight and change my hotel. Smiley plucked at the lobe of his ear. What reason did you give to London for postponing your flight? Gwillem answered. He didn't give a reason. He broke every rule in the book and some that aren't. However, Tar and Irina met next evening. And the next. And the next. They took a lot of care not to be seen, because Irina was frightened stiff, not just because of her husband, but of the security guards attached to the delegation. On the fourth evening, he drove her into the hills, and Irina told Tar that she had fallen in love with him, and that she was employed by Moscow Center, she and her husband both, and that she knew Tar was in the trade too. She could tell by his alertness, by the way he listened with his eyes. One day, she talked to Percy Allerlein and tell him a great secret all for himself. She just completely let go, Tar explained. She told me her real name, her work name, and the cover name she traveled and transmitted by. Then she starts telling me about the Soviet Hong Kong setup. I was going crazy trying to remember it all. But you did, said Gwillem curtly. Yes, Tar agreed. Near on, he did. Tar continued. I saw her the next day and the day after, and I reckoned that if she wasn't already schizoid, she was going to be that way damn soon. She kept saying, We're in mortal danger, bigger than I could possibly know. There's no hope for either of us unless she has that special chat with Percy. That was all I knew. Irina wanted to defect, talk to Percy, as she put it. So I took the plunge and walked into our residency and cabled London Station. I applied for full defector treatment for Irina in emergency procedure. I outlined her career to date and her access, including jobs she'd had at centre. I asked for inquisitors and an Air Force plane. I suggested they should send out a couple of Esterhazy's lamplighters to take charge of her, maybe a tame doctor as well. The lamplighters were Toby Esterhazy's pack based not in Brixton, but in Acton. Their job was to provide the support services for mainline operations, watching, listening, transport and safe houses. With a deceptive dreaminess, Smiley asked Tar, as she spoke of a great secret, you said, did you give any hint of this in your cable to London? Smiley had touched something, there was no doubt of it, for Tar winced, and darted a suspicious glance at Lakin, then at Willem. Guessing his meaning, Lakin at once sang out a disclaimer. Smiley knows nothing beyond what you have so far told him in this room, he said. Correct, Willem? Willem nodded, yes, watching Smiley. What words did you use precisely? Smiley asked. Tar replied, I put... Claims to have further information crucial to well-being of circus, but not yet disclosed. Near enough, anyhow. I hung round all day for an answer, but by evening it still hadn't come. Irina was doing a normal day's work. I wanted it normal right up to when she jumped. I waited till evening, then cabled a flash follow-up. Smiley's shrouded gaze fixed upon the pale face before him. 
You had an acknowledgement, of course, he asked. Just, we read you, Tar replied. By dawn, I still didn't have an answer. Then finally it came, and it was a stall. Give us more details. I drafted a reply fast and then went to meet Irina as we'd arranged the day before. We were supposed to meet outside the Baptist church, but she didn't show. It was the first time she'd broken a date. We'd arranged a fallback meeting for three hours later. There was nothing I could do but wait till then. So I sat in a cafe and then I had this idea that I might go down to the airport. I leaped into a cab and told the driver to drive like hell. I barged the information queue and asked for all departures to Russia. But there wasn't a plane since yesterday, and none till late that night. But now, I had this hunch. I asked about special flights, anything unscheduled, and was told an unscheduled Soviet plane had taken off two hours ago. Only four passengers boarded. The centre of attention was a lady in a coma. Two male nurses went with her, and one doctor. That was the party. Perhaps she was ill, said Smiley stolidly. After all, only 24 hours had passed between your first telegram and Irina's departure. You can hardly lay it at London's door with that timing. You can, just, said Willem, looking at the floor. It's extremely fast, but it does just work. If somebody in London had very good footwork, and in Moscow too, of course, or perhaps the Russians tumbled to her, Smiley insisted. Or she told her husband, Tar suggested. I understand psychology as well as the next man. I went through all those possibilities, Mr. Smiley, believe me. Anyway, I decided to fly back to London. But before I went, I wanted to check on our dead letter boxes to see whether she'd had a chance to write to me before she left. One letter box was in the church. If you kneel in the back pew and grope around, there's a loose board. It made a good drop. And there it was. Not a letter, but a whole damn diary. Slipping a long hand inside his shirt, Tar drew out a leather purse. From it he took a grimy wad of paper. This isn't it, mind, he said. This is only my copy. I guess she dropped the diary just before they hit her. Tar began to read from the diary. These notes are my gift for you, in case they take me away before I speak to Alaline. Use it well. For two years before I was attached to the trade ministry, I worked as a supervisor in the filing department at our headquarters. Under me was a clerk named Ivlov. Several times we worked night shifts together, and eventually we agreed to defy regulations and meet outside the building. We became lovers, and he told me the following story to bind us closer. Have you ever heard of Carla? He's an old fox, the most cunning in the center, the most secret. Even his name is not one that the Russians understand. Ivlov was extremely frightened to tell me this story, which concerned a great conspiracy, perhaps the greatest we have. You must tell no one in the circus for no one can be trusted until the riddle is solved. Ivlov had worked for Carla as a helper in one of Carla's great conspiracies, and he had actually been stationed in England. Ivlov's task was to service a mole. A mole is a deep penetration agent, so called because he burrows deep into the fabric of Western imperialism. The mole was an Englishman, known by the codename Gerald. To service Gerald, Ivlov was made the secret assistant to Colonel Gregor Viktorov, whose work name at the embassy is Polyakov. Viktorov is himself an old professional of great cunning, Ivlov told me. His cover job is cultural attaché, but his night work is briefing and debriefing the mole Gerald on instructions from Carla at center. It is Carla in Moscow who is the real controller of the mole Gerald. According to Ivlov, the Mole Gerald is a high functionary at the circus. Before Tar left, Smiley asked a number of questions of him. He was gazing 
not at Tar, but myopically into the middle distance, his pouchy face despondent from the tragedy. Where is the original of the diary? I put it straight back in the dead letter box. I figured it might only be a day or two before Centre sent along a footpad to take a peek round the back of the church, okay? Smiley nodded slightly and went on. All this happened more than six months ago. What have you been doing since then? Resting, said Tar rudely. He shacked up with his daughter Danny and her mother in Kuala Lumpur, said Gwillem. Then why? asked Smiley pleasantly. Did you choose this particular moment to come to us? Don't you want to spend Christmas with Danny? Sure, said Tar sullenly. But there were rumours. Some Frenchman turned up in Kuala Lumpur telling them all I owed him money. I don't owe anybody any money. What passport have you been using? Tar had his answer ready. I threw away Thomas the day I hit Malaya. In Kuala Lumpur I had them run me up a British passport. Name of Pool. I'd taken two Swiss passports with me to Hong Kong and to sash them as soon as I arrived there. I didn't use them because they were numbered, Mr. Smiley. If London had the numbers, maybe Moscow did too, if you take my meaning. So what did you do with those Swiss passports? asked Smiley. I burned them, said Tar, with a nervy ring in his voice, half threat, half fear. So when you say this Frenchman was inquiring for you, Tar interrupted, he was looking for pool. Smiley went on. But who else ever heard of pool except the man who faked your passport? Tar said nothing. Tell me how you travel to England. Smiley suggested. A soft route to Dublin, no problem. Tar lied badly under pressure. He was too fast when he had no answer ready too aggressive when he had one up his sleeve. And how did you get in touch with Mr. Gwillem? Gwillem answered for him, speaking fast. He knew where I garaged my car. He left a note on it saying he wanted to buy it and signed it with his work name, Trench. He suggested the place to meet. I brought along Fawn to babysit. Smiley interrupted. That was Fawn at the door just now. Yes. He watched my back while we talked. Gwillem said. I've kept him with us ever since. As soon as I'd heard Tar's story, I rang Lakin from a call box and asked him for an interview. Rang Lakin down here or in London? asked Smiley. Down here, said Lakin. There was a pause till Gwillem said, Well, damn it, there was no reason to suppose the phone was tapped. There was every reason, said Smiley simply. Gwillem motioned to Tar to get up. As Gwillem escorted him out, Tar said with a smile returning to his face, You know something. If Irina is right, you boys are going to need a whole new circus. When they were alone, Lakin said to Smiley, When you came to me a year ago with a similar suggestion, I'm afraid I threw you out. I suppose I should apologize. I was remiss. There was a suitable silence while he pondered his dereliction. I instructed you to abandon your inquiries. It rather crossed my mind that control had put you up to it, you see, as a way of hanging on to power and keeping Percy Alaline out. Oh, no, I assure you, said Smiley. Control knew nothing about it at all. I realize that now, returned Lakin. I didn't at the time. It's a little cool to know when to trust you people and when not. There was a pause. Then Lakin said confidingly, I'm uh, seeing the minister at eleven. I have to put him in the picture. He's your parliamentary cousin, isn't he? Anne's cousin, actually, Smiley corrected him. And Bill Hayden is also Anne's cousin. By a different route, yes answered Smiley. There was another pause. Then Lakin went on. You felt that Jim Ellis had been betrayed 
and you wanted a witch hunt. My minister and I felt there'd been gross incompetence on the part of control. We wanted a new broom. It wasn't as if you had a suspect, you know. You didn't point the finger at anyone. A directionless inquiry can be extraordinarily destructive. Smiley nodded slightly and said quietly, whereas a new broom, in this case, Percy Allerlein, sweeps cleaner. By the way, is that special source of Percy still running? The witchcraft material, or whatever it's called these days? I didn't know you were on the list, Lakin said, not at all pleased. Since you ask, yes. Source Merlin's our mainstay, and witchcraft is still the name of his product. The circus hasn't turned in such good material for years. It's all subject to special handling. Of course, now that this has happened, I've no doubt that we shall take even more rigorous precautions. I wouldn't do that if I were you, said Smiley. Gerald might smell a rat. But that's the point, isn't it? observed Lacon quickly. To do anything would be to run the risk of alarming the mole. It's the oldest question of all, George. Who can spy on the spies? The pause which followed was even longer than its predecessors. Eventually, Lacon broke the silence, saying almost casually, So I can tell the minister you'll do it then, can I? You'll take the job, clean the stables, go backwards, forwards, do whatever is necessary. It's your generation after all. Your legacy. Smiley made no reply. Why do I say Ellis? Asked Lacon conversationally. Why do I talk about the Ellis affair? And the poor man's name was Prudo. Ellis was his work name, said Smiley simply. Oh, of course, said Lacon. So many scandals in those days. One forgets the details. He was Hayden's friend, not yours. Smiley nodded. They were at Oxford together before the war. And then stablemates at the circus during and after, said Lacon. The famous hayden Prido partnership. But you were never close to him, George. To Prido, no. Like an old illness, Smiley felt his anger rise in him. Ever since his retirement, he had been denying its existence, steering clear of anything that could touch it off. Newspapers, former colleagues, gossip of the Martindale sort. You know the place went bad, he had said to himself. You know Jim Prido was betrayed. And what more eloquent testimony is there than a bullet? Two bullets in the back. And now at this very moment when he was near enough beginning to forget, a feat made no easier by his own domestic troubles, namely Anne's infatuation with an out-of-work actor, what happens? But that the reassembled ghosts of his past, Lakin, Control, Carla, Allerlein, Esterhazy, Bland, and finally Bill Hayden himself, barge into his cell and cheerfully inform him as they drag him back to this same house that everything he had suggested was true. He stared at his chubby hands, watching them shake. Too old impotent, afraid of the chase, or afraid of what he might unearth at the end of it. On the Monday morning following the Friday night meeting at Lakin's place, Peter Gwillem reflected on the story of his life so far. Until eight years ago, Gwillem had run his own agents in French North Africa. He was blown, his agents were hanged, and he entered the long middle age of the grounded pro. He deviled in London, sometimes for Smiley, and when Allerlein's crowd took over, he was shoved out to grass in Brixton. He supposed, because he had the wrong connections, among them Smiley. Of his relationship with Smiley, he dwelt principally upon the end. Gwillem was living mainly in London docks in those days. He knew, like everyone else, that a big operation had aborted in Czechoslovakia, that the Foreign Office and the Defence Ministry had jointly blown the gasket, and that Jim Prido, head of scalp hunters at Brixton, the oldest Checo hand and Bill Hayden's lifelong stringer, had been shot up and put in the bag. Later, 
he heard the catastrophe was called Operation Testify. Testify, Bill Hayden told him much later, was the most incompetent bloody operation ever launched by an old man for his dying glory, and Jim Prido was the price of it. Hayden was furious that the circus would not pay the check price for Prido's repatriation. He declared that any price was fair to get one loyal Englishman home. Give them everything, only get Jim back. Then one evening, Smiley peered round Willem's door and suggested a drink. In the pub in Wardour Street, he said, I've been sacked. And that was all. After that, Gwillem learned that more heads had rolled, and that Percy Allerline was to stand in as night watchman with the title of acting chief, and that Bill Hayden would serve under him. By Christmas, control was dead, and Gwillem departed for the Siberias of Brixton, ironically to fill Jim Prido's slot. And climbing the four steps of the circus that wet Monday afternoon, his mind bright with the prospect of felony, Gwillem passed these events in review and decided that today was the beginning of the road back. He had spent that Monday morning alone in his extremely dingy room in Brixton, photographing circus documents according to Smiley's precise instructions. First from his personal safe, the staff directory of all home-based personnel. Second, the handbook of staff duties, including the diagram of the circus reorganization under Allerline. At its center lay Bill Hayden's London station, like a giant spider in its own web. Allerline, Gwillem noticed, was billed twice, once as chief and once as director special sources. According to rumor, it was those special sources which kept the circus in business. Nothing else, in Gwillem's view, could account for the inertia of the circus at working level and the esteem it enjoyed in Whitehall. Next, he photographed a handful of routine circulars, which might be useful to Smiley as background reading. Then he put away his camera and rang London Station on a direct line and asked for Lord of Strickland of banking section. It was a question of washing some dirty money, Gwillem explained. Lorder said he could spare him half an hour. On his way to the West End, Gwillem dropped his films at the meagre premises of a certain chemist in the Charing Cross Road. He had bought some throat pastels, too. Every move must be accountable, Smiley had warned him. Assume the circus has dogs on you 24 hours a day. At the circus... Lorder was waiting for him. Well met, Peter, he said, and led the way to his room. In the corridor they met Bill Hayden. To Gwillem, Hayden was of that unrepeatable, fading circus generation to which George Smiley also belonged. Seeing them both, Hayden stood rock still. It was a month since Gwillem had spoken to him. He had probably been away on unexplained business. Hayden fixed his gaze on Gwillem. What the hell are you doing here, you pariah? he asked, pleasantly. And proceeding on his way without waiting for an answer, said to Lorder, Mind you lock up the spoons, those bloody scalp hunters will steal the gold out of your teeth. When Hayden had gone, Lorder declared, London Station could not be in better hands. Incredible record. Brilliant. At the next open doorway they passed, Gwillem looked in and saw... Roy Bland sprawled massively at his desk, clutching a paper. Tiny Toby Esterhazy was stooped over him like a head waiter, a stiff-backed miniature ambassador with silvery hair and a crisp, unfriendly jaw, and he had stretched out one hand towards the paper, as if to recommend a speciality. Bland's gaze moved slowly to Gwillem and settled there. Tiny Toby straightened up and turned his eyes also directly towards Gwillem. Their greeting was not merely frosty, it was downright hostile. Hi, said Gwillem. What's the joke? No joke, Pete, said Bland, mustering a belated smile. Just surprised to see you, that's all. Throughout his meeting with Lord of Strickland, Gwillem's mind went back to Bland and Esther Hazy, and he wondered what the hell was eating them. Well, I suppose I'd better go and clear this with the dolphin, he said at last. 
We all know how she is about Swiss banks. Diana Dolphin's room was two doors down from banking. She was one of those groomed circus brides whom no one ever marries. We shall look into it and let you know, she announced. I'll tell Lorda then, said Gwillem, and left. Move, he thought. In the men's room he waited thirty seconds at the basins, watching the door in the mirror and listening. Come on, he thought, move. He crossed the corridor, stepped boldly into the duty officer's room, closed the door and looked round. He reckoned he had ten minutes. Move. He had brought a camera, but the light was awful, so he used his memory. He made a beeline for an old cupboard. When he opened the door, dust rolled out of the bottom in a cloud. The duty logbooks were on the top shelf in bound volumes, with the dates pasted on the spines. He took down the volume for April and studied the list of names on the inside cover. He began working through the entries, searching for the nights of the 10th and 11th, when the signals traffic between London Station and Ta in Hong Kong was supposed to have taken place. From the corridor came a sudden swell of voices, and for a second he was terrified. The voices died. Sweat was running over his ribs. Move. He put back the April volume and drew four others at random, looking for comparisons. Then he looked at the night janitor's attendance lists, once again fixing his sights on those nights in April. He turned the pages forward and back several times, then closed the cupboard on the lot. He waited, listened, then stepped boldly across the corridor, back to the safety of the men's room. There he rinsed the dust off his hands, and then drifted back to Lord Strickland's room. Lord save us, that dolphin does talk, he said carelessly, and Lorda led him back to the lift. Outside he walked back as far as foils, glancing down the bus queues as he went. Think of it as a broad, Smiley had said. Remembering Roy Bland's fishy stare, Gwillem had no difficulty. And Bill, too. Was Hayden party to their same suspicion? No. Bill was in his own category, Gwillem decided, unable to resist a surge of loyalty to Hayden. From a phone box he rang a number in Mitcham, Surrey, and spoke to Inspector Mendel, formerly of the special branch, known both to Gwillem and Smiley. He gave his message, slowly, using the scholastic cover they had agreed upon, exams, students, stolen papers, as a last protection against random interception. I got those uh, happy snaps from the chemist, by the way, said Mendel, finally, when he had checked it all back. Come out a treat, not a miss among them. Thanks, said Gwillem, I'm glad. But Mendel had already rung off. I'll say one thing for moles, thought Gwillem. It's a long, dark tunnel all the way. That night, Gwillem lay awake, waiting for tomorrow, when, at Smiley's request, he intended to steal the file on the Prido affair, otherwise known as the Ellis scandal, or, more locally, Operation Testify. There are old men who go back to Oxford and find their youth beckoning to them from the stones. Smiley was not one of them. Hearing Tom Tower strike the evening six, he found himself thinking of Bill Hayden and Jim Prido, who must have arrived there the year Smiley went down, and were then gathered up by the war. He had travelled to Oxford by rail, and walked from the station, making detours all the way, Blackwell's, his old college, anywhere, then north. Reaching a cul-de-sac, he followed a high paling that bulged with shrubs. The gate of number 15 was soft on its hinges. When he pushed it, the latch was broken. The house stood a long way back. The bottom bell said sax, and he pressed it. Soon the door opened part way, held on a chain. A white, ancient face broke into a charming smile, and Miss Connie Sachs, formerly queen of research at the circus, registered her spontaneous joy. George Smiley, she cried, with a shy, trailing laugh as she drew him into the house. Why, you lovely, darling man! She closed the door after him fast. She was a big woman, 
bigger than Smiley by a head. A coke fire smouldered on the grate. Cats lay before it, and a mangy grey spaniel, too fat to move, lay on the divan. On a trolley were the tins she ate from, and the bottles she drank from. George, she murmured, watching him proudly across the room, as he took a sherry bottle from his briefcase and filled two glasses. It was hard for her to drink. Her arthritic fingers were turned downwards, as if they'd all been broken in the same accident, and her arm was stiff. Did you walk alone, George? she asked, looking at him with her shrewd pink eyes. Not uh, accompanied, were we? Smiley shook his head. Connie smiled. So what does he want from Connie, you bad boy? Her memory said Smiley gently. Polyakov. Alexei Alexandrovich Polyakov. Cultural attaché, Soviet Embassy, London. He's come alive again, just as you predicted. Oh, George, why do you have to drag up Alex? And for a while she wept. After some moments she began her story. Once upon a time there was a defector called Stanley, way back in 63. Her memory was as compendious as her body. Smiley had assumed she would begin at once with Polyakov, but she began with Stanley. Stanley, she said, was the Inquisitor's name for a fifth-rate defector from Moscow Center. Brother Stanley had a speck of gold in him. Patiently, Smiley waited for the speck of gold. For Connie was of an age when the only thing a man could give her was time. Now Stanley had defected while he was on a job in The Hague, she explained, to murder a Russian emigre who was getting on Senter's nerves. To prepare him for the mission, Senter had posted him to one of their training camps outside Moscow. Under Dutch interrogation, he had made a sketch plan of this camp and put in all the buildings he could remember. In the northwest corner of the camp grounds, he drew in five more huts. These were new, Stanley said, and they housed a special school, recently founded by Carla, for training military officers in conspiracy. So, my dear, there we were, Connie cried. For years, we'd been hearing rumors that Carla was trying to build a private army of his own inside Moscow Center. Connie had tracked back through Carla's file. She spent three weeks in Whitehall, combing Soviet Army posting bulletins for disguised entries. From a host of subjects, she reckoned she had three new, identifiable Carla trainees. She gave their names as Bardin, Stokowski, and Viktorov, all colonels. At the mention of this third name, a dullness descended over Smiley's features and his eyes turned very tired, as if he was staving off boredom. Smiley asked what became of the three in turn. In answer to his question, and Viktorov, Connie said, Sunk without trace. Oh dear, said Smiley, and his boredom seemed to deepen. Trained and disappeared off the face of the earth, she said. May have died, of course. One does tend to forget the natural causes. Smiley agreed. He had that art from miles and miles of secret life, of listening at the front of his mind, while another quite separate faculty wrestled with the historical significance of the facts. The connection ran through Tar to Irina, through Irina to her lover Ivlov, who served one, Colonel Viktorov, whose work name at the embassy was Polyakov. Smiley suggested that they should move on to the subject of Polyakov and establish just where he fitted into Carla's scheme of things and why it was that Connie had been forbidden to investigate him further. Polyakov was a six-cylinder Carla-trained hood if ever I saw one and they wouldn't even listen to me. Poor George, you tried to help but what could you do? Connie went on with her tale. 
At first, Toby Esterhazy agreed to have his Acton lamplighters cover Polyakov for random days, but each time they followed him, he was pure as the driven snow. Connie fought for continued coverage, but it was a losing battle. Then one day, a friend of hers telephoned from Acton to say he'd seen Polyakov at a wreath-laying ceremony on Remembrance Day, and he was wearing more medals than a Christmas tree. Polyakov was a war veteran, and he'd never told a soul in years. Oh, I was so excited, cried Connie. I rang Toby straight away. I want you to turn Polyakov inside out for me, I said. Connie's little hunches come home trumps. Tiny Toby hedged and said Percy Allerline was now head of operations. It was Percy's job, not his, to allocate resources. I knew straight away something was wrong, but I thought it was Toby. My report went to Percy. So what? Percy says. Not everyone who fought in the Russian army was Carla's agent. Very funny. As a sop, Toby puts the dogs on Polyakov, but nothing happens. Spike his house, I said, his car, anything. But for God's sake, do something. Because it's a pound to a ruble that Polyakov is running an English mole. So Percy sends for me, all lofty. You have to leave Polyakov alone, he says. You have to put him out of your silly woman's mind, do you understand? He follows it up with a rude letter. We spoke, and you agreed. I wrote, Yes, repeat no, at the bottom, and sent it back to him. Final answer. You're losing your sense of proportion, Connie, time you went out into the real world. I hate the real world, George. I like the circus, and all my lovely boys. She took his hands trying to interlace her fingers with his. Did uh, Polyakov have a leg man? Smiley asked. Yes, Connie said. A clerk at the embassy. She suspected him of being one Ivlov, but she couldn't prove it, and no one would help her. So you reported that too? Smiley asked. Connie nodded. And what happened? Connie was sacked, she said and yawned. Hey-ho, halcyon days. Did I start a landslide, George? The fire was quite dead. Connie began humming, then swaying to her own music. He stayed, trying to cheer her up. He gave her more drink, and finally it brightened her. She was dreaming of her lovely boys in the circus. Poor loves, she said, trained to empire, trained to rule the waves, all gone, all taken away. You're the last, George, you and Bill, and filthy Percy a bit. Smiley left Connie still dreaming and caught a train to Slough, where Mendel was waiting for him with a hired car and the sum of Peter Gwillem's researches. The duty officer's ledger contained no record of the night of the 10th and 11th of April, Mendel reported. The pages had been excised with razor blades. The janitor's returns for the same night were also missing, as were the signal's returns. Peter thinks it was done quite recently, said Mendel. There's a note scribbled on the next page saying, all inquiries to head of London Station. It's in Esther Hayes's handwriting, and dated Friday. Last Friday, said Smiley, turning so fast that his seatbelt let out a whine of complaint. That's the day Tar arrived in England. It's all according to Peter, Mendel said stolidly. And finally, he added that Toby Esther Hayes's lamplighter reports carried no adverse trace whatsoever of Ivlov or of cultural attaché Polyakov, both of the Soviet Embassy, London. Then Mendel handed over the photographs, the result of Gwillem's foray to Brixton. Close to Paddington Station, Smiley got out. As he was closing the car door behind him, 
Mendel said, I think I've found the school. A place called Thursgoods, near Taunton. He's got a caravan, I hear. I'll check him out. Bang on his door. Sell him a hoover or something. Yes, said Smiley. That's the thing to do. Jim's a pro, he explained. He's good, whatever they did to him. Good night. The Smiley walked towards the Hotel Isla in Sussex Gardens. The day after his visit to Ascot, he had set up his operational headquarters there under the name of Barraclough. The proprietor, Mrs. Pope Graham, had been an informant of Inspector Mendel's for many years. Preparing for Smiley's stay there, Mendel had said to her, I'll want a list of suspicious persons taking an interest or putting questions to your staff under a pretext. Same with his incoming letters. I'll want postmarks and times posted, but not tampering or holding back. There's only one person allowed to look at anything apart from him. Me. Understand? And don't fiddle with anything or he'll know because he's sharp. It's got to be expert fiddling. I'm not saying any more. And with that, Inspector Mendel handed her twenty pounds for her services. If twenty quid was all it cost them, Mendel remarked to Smiley later, it was the cheapest babysitting service in the business. That evening, Lacon called on Smiley at the hotel, carrying a fat briefcase containing the first consignment of papers from his office. Next morning on his way to work, Lacon reclaimed the papers and returned the book Smiley had given him to pad out his briefcase. Smiley could not have read the files by day, because they were on call to Lakin's staff, and their absence would have caused an uproar. In any case, Smiley knew he was desperately short of time. Over the next three days, each evening, Lakin dropped off the papers, and each morning, after three hours' sleep and a disgusting breakfast, Smiley waited for Lakin to arrive then slipped gratefully into the cold winter's day to take his place among his fellow men. They were extraordinary nights for Smiley alone up there on the top floor of the seedy little hotel. Operation Witchcraft read the title on the first volume Lakin had brought. Policy regarding distribution of special product. Operation Witchcraft read the second. Supplementary estimates to the Treasury. Special accommodation in London, financing arrangements, etc. Source Merlin read the third. Customer evaluations, cost effectiveness, wider exploitations. See also Secret Annex. But the Secret Annex was not attached, and when Smiley had asked for it, there was coldness from Lacon. The minister keeps it in his personal safe, he'd snapped. Do you know the combination? asked Smiley. Certainly not, he retorted, now furious. Does it give the identity of Merlin? Don't be ridiculous, George. The minister would not want to know, and Alaline would not want to tell him. By rights, I should have you specially cleared as it is. Witchcraft cleared? Do we have a list of people who have been cleared that way? It was in the policy file, Lacon retorted, and got up to leave. You won't forget Prudhoe, will you? said Smiley. Just anything you have on him at all. With that, Smiley left Lacon to glare a while. You're not going fay, are you, George? You realize that Prudhoe had most likely never even heard of witchcraft before he was shot. And with that, Lacon left. It was Tuesday night when Smiley turned to the last of the batch. Operation Witchcraft, Correspondence with Department. The department was one of Whitehall's euphemisms for the circus. This volume took the form of official minutes between the minister on one side and Percy Allerlein on the other, who was, at that time, still confined to the bottom rungs on Control's ladder of beings. A very dull monument, Smiley reflected, surveying these much-handled files to the long and cruel war between Alaline and Control. It was this war which, in its main battles, Smiley now relived as he embarked upon his reading. The files contained only the thinnest record of it. His memory contained far more. Control had taken great joy in the drafting of Percy Alaline's 
personal charter as operational director. This charter, which at a glance had a most impressive shape, gave Alaline the right to examine all operations before they were launched. The small print made this right conditional upon the consent of the operational sections, and control made sure that this was not forthcoming. What have I done to him? Alaline asked Smiley, whose job it was to keep people off Control's back. Why does it pick on me? We'd a brush or two. What's so unusual about that? All I want is a place at the top table. God knows my record entitles me to that. Sighing, Smiley began to read. We spoke, wrote Alaline to the minister. Witchcraft reports derive from a source of extreme sensitivity. To my mind, no existing method of Whitehall distribution meets the case. I've already spoken to naval intelligence, and they are prepared to put at our disposal a special reading room in the Admiralty main building, where the material is made available to customers and watched over by a senior janitor of this service. Customers with reading rights will identify themselves personally to my janitor. Witchcraft, Smiley recalled, his memory again, for the files knew nothing so plainly human, was Percy Alaline's first successful attempt in his new post at launching his own operation. Control had summoned Smiley to his office one day. He was sitting at his desk, and Alaline was standing at the window. Between them lay a plain folder. Sit over there and take a look at this nonsense, said Control. Inside the folder was a photograph of what purported to be a high-level Soviet naval dispatch, 15 pages long. For months, the Admiralty had been screaming at the circus for anything relating to this particular exercise. It therefore had an impressive topicality, which at once, in Smiley's eyes, made it suspect. Whose uh, initials are these? Smiley asked, referring to some annotations penciled in Russian in the margin. Admiral Zarov of the Black Sea Fleet, said Alaline. It's not dated, Smiley objected. It's a draft, Alaline replied complacently. Where does it come from? Smiley asked, still lost. Percy doesn't feel able to tell, said Control angrily. In their long association, Smiley could not remember him so angry. What do our own evaluators say. They've not seen it, said Alaline, and what's more, they're not going to. But where does it come from? Smiley insisted. Source Merlin, Alaline said, a highly placed source with access to the most sensitive levels of Soviet policy making. We have dubbed his product witchcraft. Now get him to tell you why he won't tell you, said Control. Alaline was undeterred. The identity of Source Merlin is a secret, which is not mine to divulge. It's the fruit of a long cultivation by certain people in this service. Now for a while, Acon's files, instead of Smiley's memory, once more took up the story. Control withdrew into the solitude of his dingy office. He sent for countless office files. Smiley would see them pile before the door as he went about his own business of trying to keep the rest of the circus afloat. Control never said what he was doing, but Smiley knew, as he returned to his reading, that Control's ghost was his companion into all but the furthest reaches of his journey of exploration, and might even have stayed the whole distance if Operation Testify at the eleventh hour had not stopped him dead. For six weeks, according to the files, the naval dispatch from Source Merlin had no successor. Then, in the seventh week, Alaline had announced publication of a second, third and fourth witchcraft report, all on the same day. All took the form of secret Soviet interdepartmental correspondence, though the topics varied widely. If accurate, these reports were extremely valuable. With mounting interest, Smiley continued his journey through Lacon's records. At the time... Such a mood of suspicion had gripped the circus that even between Control and Smiley, the subject of Source Merlin became taboo. Control's going potty, Hayden had told Smiley one day with contempt. And if I'm not mistaken, he's also dying. 
It's just a question of which gets him first. Smiley had a growing feeling that control wanted him out of the way. When they talked, he felt a heavy strain of suspicion between them, so that even Smiley seriously wondered whether Bill was right and control was unfit for his job. The files made it clear that those next three months saw a steady flowering of the witchcraft operation, without any help from control. Reports came in at the rate of two or even three a month, and the standard, according to the customers, remained excellent. A witchcraft committee was formed, with the minister in the chair, and Alaline as vice-chairman. Merlin had become an industry. In desperation, control had sent for Smiley. There are three of them. And Alaline, he said. Sweat them, George. Tempt them. Bully them. Give them whatever they eat. Smiley repeated this to himself as he studied Lacon's list of those who had been witchcraft cleared. The four founding fathers still headed the list. Alaline, Bland, Esther Hazy, and Bill Hayden. Three of them and Alaline, Control had said. Smiley remembered the course of his investigation. He had chosen Esther Hazy first because Toby owed Smiley his career. Smiley had recruited him in Vienna as a starving student. So Smiley drove down to Acton to see him. He asked Toby outright whether his boys had been doing any special jobs recently, either at home or abroad, which for good reasons of security Toby didn't feel able to mention in his returns. Who would I do that for, George? Toby had asked, dead-eyed. You know, in my book, that's completely illegal. Well, uh, I can see you doing it for Percy Alaline, for one. And Smiley offered a few possibilities. Clear a foreign letterbox, perhaps. Prime a safe house. Watch someone's back. Spike an embassy. Percy's director of operations, after all. You might think he was acting on instructions from control. I can see that happening quite reasonably. But Smiley got nowhere with Toby Esterhazy. Smiley searched through Lacon's files till he came to a slim volume, which recorded the earliest expenses incurred through the running of Source Merlin. Alaline wrote, For reasons of security, it is proposed to keep the witchcraft financing absolutely separate from all other circus impresses. A glance at the first row of figures showed Smiley all he needed to know. Already by May of that year, when Smiley saw Esther Hazy at Acton, Toby had personally made no fewer than eight trips abroad on the witchcraft budget. In each case, the purpose of the visit was described curtly as collecting product. Between May and November, when control faded from the scene, he made a further 19. Most took place at weekends, and several times he was accompanied by Bland. Not to put too fine an edge on it, Toby Esterhazy, as Smiley had never seriously doubted, had lied in his teeth. It was nice to find the record confirming his impression. Next, Smiley remembered, he had approached Bland. They met in a pub in St. John's Wood. It was still May. So, uh, what's the deal? Bland asked affably. There isn't one, really, Roy. Control feels that the present situation is unhealthy. He doesn't like to see the young getting mixed up in a cabal, nor do I. Great. So, what's the deal? Unlike Esther Hazy, Bland had not even bothered to lie. Lacon's files made no bones of his involvement in the witchcraft operation. Source Merlin, wrote Alaline, in a minute dated soon after Control's departure, is in every sense a committee operation. I cannot honestly say which of my three assistants deserves the most praise. The energy of Bland has been an inspiration to us all. He then added, Hayden's operational ingenuity is at times little short of Merlin's own. And that brought me to Bill, Smiley thought, as he recalled their meeting, their friendly little chat at Bywater Street. I suppose you want to grill me about bloody Merlin, Bill began. Well, they do say you write the reports, Smiley explained. I thought that was uh, Bland's job, said Bill, with his foxy grin. Roy makes the translations, said Smiley. You draft the covering reports. They're typed on your machine. 
control thinks Percy's on the make, you see. So he is, replied Hayden. So am I. I want to be head boy. Time I made something of myself, George. Who runs Merlin Bill? Hayden changed tack and asked, Doesn't anyone think my nose should be out of joint? I am supposed to be in charge of the Russian target, you know. Then along comes Percy shoving a whole wagon load of Russian goodies. Bloody annoying, don't you think? Very, said Smiley. Is Control dead yet? Hayden asked. I'm just busy. What does he do all day? What's he after? I didn't know he was after anything, said Smiley. Oh, stop flirting around, George. Of course he is. Control's been toiling through personal dossiers of old circus heroes, sniffing out the dirt, who was pink, who was a queen, and for why? Because we got a success on our hands. He's mad, George. That ended his interview with Hayden. Next day, Control said, Bill's backside must look like a damn gridiron the years he's spent sitting on the fence. I'm glad he's not my cousin. The following Monday, there had been surprising news for Smiley. Control had flown to Belfast for discussions with the army. Later, checking travel impresses, Smiley nailed the lie. No one in the circus had flown to Belfast that month, but there was a charge for first-class return to Vienna, and the issuing authority was given as G. Smiley. Facts. What were the facts? The facts were, thought Smiley, that one balmy pre-witchcraft summer evening, I returned unexpectedly from Berlin to find Bill Hayden stretched on the drawing room floor of my house in Bywater Street, and Anne playing Liszt on the gramophone. There was no scene. Everybody behaved with painful naturalness. According to Bill, he had dropped by on his way from the airport, having just flown in from Washington. Anne had been in bed, but insisted on getting up to receive him. Next morning, without even wishing to, Smiley established that Bill had been back in London two days, not one. With a sigh, Smiley resumed his reading of Merlin's progress, since his own enforced retirement from the circus. The new regime of Percy Alleline he had once noticed had immediately produced several favorable changes in Merlin's lifestyle. The night dashes to European capitals ceased. The flow of intelligence became more regular, less nervy. Merlin's demands for money continued. We spoke, wrote Alleline to the minister, in a minute dated February the 27th this year. You agreed to submit a supplementary estimate to the Treasury for a London house to be carried on the witchcraft budget. Smiley read this again more slowly. A London house to be carried on the witchcraft budget. Alleline refused to reveal the address or the justification for this remarkable and costly addition to an operation that was supposedly taking place abroad. Smiley searched eagerly for a solution. It was not till he went back to the files which appraised the witchcraft product that he came on the solution. The house was paid for in late March. Occupancy followed immediately. From the same date exactly, Merlin began to acquire a personality. At this point, an improbable figure flitted across the stage. One J.P. Ribble, a member of the Foreign Office Research Department. J.P. Ribble was puzzled as he consulted the material in the special reading room of the Admiralty. He wrote, May I respectfully draw your attention to an apparent discrepancy concerning dates? Witchcraft number 104 is dated April the 21st. Merlin had this information directly from General Markov on that same day. But on that day, according to our embassy, Markov was in Paris. And Merlin, as witnessed your report number 109, was himself visiting a missile research establishment outside Leningrad. The minutes cited no fewer than four similar discrepancies, which put together suggested a degree of mobility in Merlin that would have done credit to his miraculous namesake. But in a separate minute to the minister, Alleline made an extraordinary admission which shed an entirely new light on the nature of the witchcraft operation. 
extremely secret and personal, wrote Allerlein. Merlin is not one source, but several. At this point in his research, Smiley was disturbed by the telephone ringing. Mr. Barraclough, this is Lofthouse, sir, from Finance. Peter Gwillem, using the emergency procedure, was asking by means of the agreed phrases for a crash meeting, and he sounded shaken. That morning, the Tuesday, Gwillem had steeled himself for the task ahead of him. Lakin swears he holds no file on testify at all, Smiley had explained in his usual worried way. He has a few resettlement papers on Brido and nothing else. And in the same lugubrious tone, so I'm afraid we'll have to find a way of getting hold of whatever there is in Circus Registry. For getting hold, in Smiley's dictionary, read steel. And that was the precise nature of Gwillem's task. When Gwillem arrived at the Circus archives, he stowed a brown canvas grip he'd been carrying with Alwyn, an effeminate marine who was on the door there. Gwillem pushed open the swing doors to the reading room and approached the centre desk. The archivist smiled at him, and Gwillem nodded back to her, helping himself to a bunch of green requisition slips. Still at the desk, he filled in slips for the next two references on his list. He watched her stamp them, tear off the carbons, and post them to a slot on her desk. D, corridor, she murmured, handing back the top copies. Pushing open the far door, Gwillem entered the main hall, and moved slowly along the shelves, reading the fluorescent number cards. He ascertained where the testify file should be from its code number, which he already knew. His reconnaissance complete, he drew the two files he had requested, leaving the green slips in the steel bracket provided for them. He returned to the reading room, and for some minutes pretended to study the files. Then, armed with the green slip with a 4-3 reference number on it, he returned the two files to their places and positioned himself at the shelf next to testify. The testify reference was a 4-4 number. The green slip read 4343, and he found the file at once, because he'd already marked it down. It had a pink jacket like testify. Like testify was reasonably well thumbed. He fitted the green slip into the bracket and removed the 4-3 file. He moved to the next shelf along took down the testify file, and very swiftly replaced it with the same 4-3 file. Holding the testify file casually in his right hand, title inward to his body, Willem returned to the reading room, and again sat at his desk. Odd to be pinching a file about one's predecessor. Odd to have Jim as a predecessor, come to think of it. Now, if you could contrive... Smiley had said when briefing Gwillem for the job, but to take your car in for a service at your local garage, using your home phone to make the appointment, of course, in the hope that Toby is listening. Perhaps you could arrange to receive a phone call on the same matter at the archives. When Alwyn came through the door, Gwillem didn't even look up from the file. Telephone, sir, he murmured. Oh, to hell, said Gwillem seemingly deep in his studies. Who is it? Outside line, sir. The garage, I think, regarding your car. Said he got some bad news for you. Willem rose, holding the testify file in both hands. Alwyn went ahead and held the swing door for him, and he passed through it, reading the file. Like a damned choir boy, he thought. He waited for lightning to strike him, but it didn't happen. He went to the telephone cubicle. The lower part was panelled the upper part glass. Lifting the receiver, he placed the file at his feet and heard Mendel tell him he needed a new gearbox. They'd work this out for the benefit of whoever might be listening in. He heard himself say, Well, at least get on to the main suppliers and find out how long it will take to get the damn thing. And then, irritably, Hang on! He half opened the door and kept the mouthpiece jammed against his backside because he was very concerned that this part of the conversation should not go on tape. Alwyn, chuck me my bag a minute, will you? Alwyn brought it over keenly, like a first-aid man at a football match. All right, Mr. Gwillem, sir. 
open it for you, sir. Oh, just dump it there, thanks. The bag was on the floor outside the cubicle. Now he stooped, dragged it inside and unzipped it. In it were three dummy files, one buff, one green, one pink. He took out the pink file and his address book and replaced them with a testify file. He stood up, closed the zip, and read Mendel the telephone number of the main supplier. He rang off, handed Alwyn the bag, and returned to the reading room with the dummy file. Recovering the 4-3 file from the testify pigeonhole, he replaced it with the dummy, and returned the 4-3 to its proper place. God is in his heaven, he thought, as he removed the green slip from its bracket. Back in the reading room, he ran into Toby Esterhazy. Peter, said Toby, in his not quite perfect English, I am so sorry to disturb you, but we have a tiny crisis, and Percy Allerlyne would like quite an urgent word with you. At the door, as Alwyn let them out, Willem said, There's a midday shuttle to Brixton, Alwyn. You might just give transport a buzz and ask them to take my grip over for me, will you? Will do, sir, said Alwyn. Will do. Mind the step, sir. And you pray for me, thought Gwillem. Toby escorted Gwillem to Percy Allerline's office. Allerline sat at the head of the table, reading a two-page document, and he didn't stir when Gwillem came in. He just growled, Down there with you, and went on reading with heavy concentration. The chair to Allerline's right was empty and Gwillem knew it was Hayden's. Apart from Bill, everyone was there. Gwillem sat down, and Toby sat next to him, like a bodyguard. What the hell do they expect me to do, thought Gwillem. Make a dash for freedom. Everyone was watching Allerline fill his pipe when Bill Hayden upstaged him. The door opened, and at first no one came in. But then a slow shuffle, and Bill appeared, with a folder jammed under one arm, and a cup of coffee in his hands. His glasses were over his nose for a change, so he must have done his reading elsewhere. They've all been reading it except me, thought Gwillem, and I don't know what it is. Allerline half looked up and said, Well now, young Peter Gwillem, I hear you've been hobnobbing with our late lamented brother Tar. How is he these days? Gwillem selected a facetious tone. That's right, chief. Tar and I have tea at Fortnum's every afternoon. I'm very disappointed in you, Allerline continued in his pert Scottish brogue, giving ear to gross slanders of a divisive and insidious nature. I pay you honest money and you stab me in the back. Tell us some more about Tar's circumstances just now. He has a daughter, has he not? Name of Danny. Does he talk of her at all? He used to, replied Gwillem. Allerline drew a deep breath. There's a law, Peter Gwillem, against consorting with enemy agents. But I haven't been, said Gwillem, as anger came to his rescue. It's not me who's playing parlor games, it's you, so get off my back. In the same moment, he sensed the relaxation round the table, like a tiny descent into boredom, like a general recognition that Allerline had shot off all his ammunition and the target was unmarked. So, he used to chat to you about Danny, eh? said Allerline, back at the document before him. If I had told you that Danny and her mother were due to arrive three days ago at London Airport on a direct flight from Singapore, I may take it you would share our perplexity. Willem nodded. You would also keep your mouth shut when you got out of here. Willem nodded again. Allerline continued. So what would you make of this information? Come on. You were his boss. Why is Tar coming to England? That's not what you said at all. You said Tar's girl and his daughter Danny were expected in London three days ago. Perhaps she's visiting relations. Perhaps she's got a new boyfriend. How should I know? Listen to me, said Allerline sharply. Danny and her mother are traveling to England on fake British passports in the name of Poole. The passports are Russian fakes. A third went to Tar himself, the well-known Mr. Poole. 
Tar is already in England, but we don't know where. Willem hit back with feigned resentment. All right, the Russians have turned tar around. Why is it all so hot? What sort of a plant can he be when we don't believe a word he says? Never mind what sort of a plant, snapped Alaline. Muddying pools, poisoning wells, maybe. But just you remember this. Of the first whisper of him or his lady or his wee daughter, young Peter Willem, you come to one of us grown-ups. Anyone you see at this table, but not another damn soul. Because there are more wheels within wheels here than you can possibly guess or have any right to know. Suddenly the meeting was over. A paper was pushed across the table for Gwillem to sign. He read it. I certify that I have today been advised on the contents of witchcraft report number 308, Source Merlin. I undertake not to divulge any part of this report to other members of the service, nor will I divulge the existence of Source Merlin. I also undertake to report at once any matter which comes to my notice that appears to bear on this material. As Gwillem signed, he was thinking only one thing. Tar. That bastard Ricky Tar. Shortly after Gwillem had telephoned Smiley at the hotel, they met at Crystal Palace, a van pickup with Mendel driving. They drove to Barnsbury, where they changed cars. Mendel stayed behind with the testify fire which Gwillem had brought from Brixton. As they drove towards their destination in Suffolk, Smiley directed the way, trying to calm Gwillem down and steady his driving. Take the A-12. Tar has not lied to us, Peter. Not in any material way. He has simply done what agents do the world over. He has failed to tell us the whole story. Eventually, they arrived at the farmhouse where Fawn was babysitting Tar. Fawn was waiting for them. Ricky's been a lot better today, sir, he reported to Smiley. Has he been out alone? Smiley asked. No, sir. Has he used the telephone? Gracious, no, sir. Has he mentioned his daughter, Danny? Over the weekend, he did a lot, Fawn explained. Now he's sort of cooled off about them. Smiley persisted with his questions. He hasn't talked about arrangements for seeing them again when all this is over. No, sir. Gwillem chimed in irritably. So what has he talked about, for heaven's sake? The Russian lady, sir. Irina. He says when the mole's caught, he's going to make Moscow centre swap him for Irina. Then they'll get a place together up in Scotland. Smiley led the way upstairs to Tar's room. Fawn waited on the lower landing in case he was needed. Left to himself, Gwillem would have been very rough with Tar. He had no doubt about it. As it was, Smiley knocked at Tar's door and said, I want to chat with you. Tar opened the door fast. He must have heard them coming. I'm sorry to be pestering you, said Smiley, with an air of extreme commiseration. But I must ask you again what you did with those two Swiss escape passports you took with you to Hong Kong. Tar's jauntiness was all gone. As he sat on the bed with a gun on the pillow beside him, his eyes sought them out nervously, each in turn, trusting nothing. I told you I burned them, he said at last. Might as well put a label round your neck. Ricky Tar wanted, soon as use those passports. Smiley's questions were terribly slow in coming. When you bought your British passport in the name of Poole, Smiley asked, did you buy any other passports from the same sort? Why should I? But Smiley did not feel like giving reasons. All right said Tar sullenly. So I got passports for Danny and her mother. Mrs. Poole, Miss Danny Poole. What do we do now? Cry out in ecstasy? Again it was the silence that accused. The sweat on Tar's face was suddenly unbearable. There was too much of it. It was like tears all over. And perhaps you did burn them, continued Smiley. You burnt the British passports, I mean, not the Swiss ones. Go easy, George, thought Gwillem. 
and softly moved a pace nearer to cover the gap between them. Just go easy. You knew that the pool was blown, said Smiley. So you burned the pool passports you had bought for Danny and her mother, but you kept your own because there was no alternative. Then you made travel bookings for them in the name of pool in order to convince everybody that you still believed in the pool passports. By everybody, I think I mean Carla's footpads, don't I? Then you doctored the Swiss escapes, one for Danny and one for her mother, taking a chance the numbers wouldn't be noticed and you made a different set of arrangements which you didn't advertise. Even from where he stood, Gwillem was too slow. Tar's hands were at Smiley's throat. The chair toppled and Tar fell with him. From the heap, Gwillem selected Tar's right arm and flung it into a lock against his back, bringing it very near to breaking as he did so. From nowhere, Fawn appeared, took the gun from the pillow and walked back to Tar as if to give him a hand. Then Smiley was straightening his suit, and Tar was back on the bed, dabbing the corner of his mouth with a handkerchief. Smiley said, I don't know where they are. As far as I know, no harm has come to them. You believe that, do you? Tar was staring at him, waiting. His eyes were furious. But over Smiley, a kind of calm had settled and Gwillem guessed it was the reassurance he had been hoping for. Maybe you should keep a better eye on your own damn woman and leave mine alone, Tar whispered, his hand across his mouth. With an exclamation, Gwillem sprang forward, but Smiley restrained him. As long as you don't try to communicate with them, Smiley continued, it's probably better that I shouldn't know, unless you want me to do something about them. Money or protection or comfort of some sort. Tar shook his head. There was blood in his mouth, a lot of it. And Gwillem realized that Fawn must have hit him, but he couldn't work out when. It won't be long now, Smiley said. Perhaps a week. Less, if I can manage it. Try not to think too much. By the time they left, Tar was grinning again. So Gwillem guessed that the visit... All the insult to Smiley, all the smash in the face, had done him good. The memory plays strange tricks on the exhausted, overladen brain. As Gwillem drove, odd images of this and other long days drifted freely through his memory. Days of plain terror in Morocco, as one by one his agent lines went dead on him, and every footfall on the stair had him scurrying to the window to check the street. Days of idleness in Brixton, when he watched that poor world slip by and wondered how long before he joined it. And suddenly the written report was there before him on his desk. Cyclo styled on blue flimsy because it was traded, source unknown and probably unreliable. And every word of it came back to him in letters a foot high. According to a recently released prisoner from Rubianka, Moscow Center held a secret execution in the punishment block in July. The victims were three of its own functionaries. One was a woman. All three were shot in the back of the neck. It was stamped internal, said Gwillem, dully, as they drove. Somebody from London Station had scribbled on it. Can anyone identify the bodies? By the vague light inside the car, Gwillem watched Smiley's face pucker with disgust. Yes, Smiley agreed at last. Yes, well, now, the woman was Irina, wasn't she? Then there was Ivlov, and then there was Boris, her husband, I suppose. Tar mustn't know, he continued. It is vital he should have no wind of this. God knows what he would do if he knew that Irina was dead. For some moments, neither said anything. Perhaps, for their different reasons, neither had the strength just then, or the heart. In a quiet voice, Smiley asked, Tell me, how much do you know about Carla? About as much as I know about witchcraft and source Merlin, and whatever else it said on the paper I signed in Adeline's office, Gwillem replied. Ah, uh, well now, said Smiley. 
It's a very good answer, as it happens. You meant it as a rebuke, but as it happens, the analogy was most apt. Carla was a mystery, Smiley said. Decades of his life were not accounted for, and probably never would be, since the people he worked with had a way of dying off or keeping their mouths shut. Smiley began to relate the legend of Carla. Gwillem had never known Smiley talk this way. He was not given to confidences or long lectures. Gwillem knew him as a shy man, for all his vanities, and one who expected very little communication. Gwillem listened intently to the tale. In the summer of 55, the Indian authorities arrested Carla on vague immigration charges. He had just flown in from California. Circus gossip later linked him with the big treason scandals in Britain and the States. Smiley knew better. Carla was in disgrace again. Moscow was out for his blood, and we thought we might persuade him to defect. That was why I flew to Delhi to have a chat with him. In the mid-fifties, Moscow Center was in pieces on the floor. Senior officers were being shot or purged wholesale, and its lower ranks were seized with a collective paranoia. As a first result, there was a crop of defections among center officers stationed overseas. Uh, somehow we had to respond, and in no time I became a kind of commercial traveler, flying off one day to a capital city, the next to a dingy border outpost, to sign up defecting Russians. Uh, at that time, you must understand, Carla was just another client. That was all I or anyone at the circus knew when I flew to Delhi. And the heat in the room where Carla was being held was appalling, Smiley continued. What did Carla look like? Gwillem asked. Avuncular, modest and avuncular. Little wiry chap with silvery hair, bright brown eyes and plenty of wrinkles. I trotted out my piece as I had a dozen times that year already. Come to the West and we can give you, within reason, a decent life. On the other hand, you can go home and I suppose they'll shoot you or send you to a camp. Then I sat back and wiped away the sweat and waited for him to say, Yes, thank you. He did nothing. He didn't speak. He simply sat there, stiff and tiny, looking at me with his brown, rather jolly eyes. I had said my piece, and in reply, Carla said nothing. Well, any fool knows that if that ever happens, you get up and walk out. Take it or leave it, you say. As it was, I found myself talking about Anne. Smiley left no time for Gwillem's muffled exclamation. Oh, not my Anne, not in as many words. About his Anne, I assumed he had one. I had asked myself, what would a man think about in such a situation? What would I? And my mind came up with the answer. His woman. I also knew from observation reports that Carla was a chain smoker. American cigarettes, camels. I sent the guard out for several packs of them. I asked Carla, where was she? It was a question I would dearly have wished answered about Anne. No reply. I put it to him that his going back to Moscow would do nothing for her at all. Then the guard came back with the cigarettes. I tore open a pack and offered Carla a cigarette. Come, I said. You're a chain smoker. Everyone knows that. These are your favorite brand. And I offered him my lighter. Carla stood up and politely indicated that he wished to return to his own cell. As he left, he changed his mind and helped himself to a pack of cigarettes and the lighter, my lighter, a gift from Anne. To George from Anne with all my love. For a while now, Smiley sat silent, and then he said, I flew home, and Control said, Well, I hope to God they do shoot him. Willem asked, Did Carla ever really think of staying? I'm sure it never crossed his mind, said Smiley with disgust. Carla got home and set to work reactivating his old agents. It's odd to reflect that all the time he was looking at me and saying nothing, he could have been thinking of Gerald. 
I expect they've had a good laugh about it since. And he still has Anne's cigarette lighter. Yours, Willem corrected him. Yes, yes, mine, of course. But tell me, Peter, was Tar referring to anyone in particular when he made that unpleasant reference to Anne? Gwillem nodded. The rumor is as precise as that, Smiley inquired. And it goes that far down the line, even to Tar. What does it say, precisely? That Bill Hayden was Anne Smiley's lover, said Gwillem feeling that coldness coming over him, which was his protection when he broke bad news. Ah, said Smiley. I see. Thank you. There was a very awkward silence. Eventually, Gwillem asked, So who's source Merlin? Where could Alaline have had his information from, if not from the Russians themselves? Oh, he had it from the Russians, all right. But for God's sake, Gwillem interrupted, if the Russians sent Tar, they didn't, said Smiley. Nor did Tar use the British passports, did he? The Russians got it wrong. What Alaline had was the proof that Tar had fooled them. So what the hell did Percy mean about muddying pools, asked Gwillem. He must have been talking about Irina, for heaven's sake. And Gerald, Smiley agreed. Again they drove in silence, and the gap between them suddenly seemed unbridgeable. Look, I'm not quite there myself, Peter, Smiley said quietly, but nearly I am. Carla's pulled the circus inside out, but there's a last clever knot, and I can't undo it, though I mean to. It was raining as they reached the vicinity of the hotel. Smiley got out to walk the last hundred yards and said, Peter, I want you to take it easy from now on. Closing the passenger door after him, Gwillem had the sudden urge to wish Smiley good night, or even good luck. So he leaned across the seat and rolled down the passenger window and drew in his breath to call. But Smiley was gone. He had never known anyone who could disappear so quickly in a crowd. Throughout the remainder of the night, Smiley remained bowed over the files, reading, comparing, annotating, cross-referring. He broke down the witchcraft reports into those which were demonstrably topical at the time they were received, and those which could have been banked a month or two before, either by Merlin or his controllers, and saved for a rainless day. Having listed the topical reports, he set down their dates in a single column and threw out the rest. At this point, his mood could best be compared with that of a scientist who senses by instinct that he's on the brink of a discovery and is awaiting any minute the logical connection. He was looking for the last clever knot which Carla had tied in order to explain away the precise suspicions to which Irina's diary had given shape. He came up with some peculiar preliminary findings. First, that on the nine occasions when Merlin had produced a topical report, either Polyakov had been in London, or Toby Esterhazy had taken a quick trip abroad. Second, that over the crucial period following Tar's adventure in Hong Kong this year, Polyakov was in Moscow for urgent cultural consultations, and that soon afterwards, Merlin came through with some of his most spectacular and topical material. Backtracking again, Smiley discovered that the converse was also true. The reports he had discarded on the grounds that they had no close attachment to recent events were those which, most generally, went into distribution while Polyakov was in Moscow or on leave. And then he had it. Between the Mole Gerald and the source Merlin, there was an interplay that could no longer be denied. That Merlin's proverbial versatility allowed him to function as Carla's agent, as well as Alaline's. The next day, Smiley paid three calls. The first visit was to Max. Max, I want to talk to you, said Smiley. It's about Jim Prido. Sure, said Max, in his heavy Slav accent. 
I'm not in the circus anymore. Did they tell you? Smiley asked. Max shrugged. I was sacked, said Smiley. I guess about the same time as you. I don't want them to know, Max. You private, I private too, said Max. And from a gold case offered Smiley a cigarette, which he declined. I want to hear what happened, Smiley went on. I wanted to find out before they sacked me, but there wasn't time. That why they sack you? Maybe, said Smiley. I don't know anything, Max. I had no part in it at all. I was in Berlin when it happened. I knew nothing of the planning or the background. They cabled me, but when I arrived in London, it was too late. Planning, Max repeated. <laughs> Jesus, that was some planning. His jaw and cheeks suddenly became a mass of lines and his eyes turned narrow. Jim had a special job to do, said Smiley. He asked for you. Sure, Jim asked for Max to babysit. And Max began to tell his story. It was a Monday evening in mid-October, the 16th. It was a slack time. Max hadn't been abroad for weeks and he was fed up. Jim came to him and said there was a special job going. Something so big, so secret that no one else in the circus, not even Toby Esterhazy, was allowed to know that it was taking place. The whole job shouldn't last more than one weekend, said Jim. They should be in on Saturday and out on Sunday. A three-day hit, Jim repeated. A clandestine conference in Czechoslovakia, just outside Bruno. Jim had a big map and they studied it. Jim would travel Czech, Max would go Austrian and they were to make a 6.30 rendezvous on Saturday evening. From there, they were to drive out of Bruno. Somewhere along the Ratchitsa road, they would pass a parked black car. The driver would show them where to park the car and take them to the final rendezvous in his own vehicle. That was all, Jim said. As far as Bruno, Max went on, things went pretty much as planned. At Bruno, Jim missed the first rendezvous but he made the fall back an hour later. Max supposed at first the train was late, but Jim just said, drive slowly, and he knew then that there was trouble. Jim said there'd been a change of plan. Max was to stay right out of it. He should drop Jim short of the rendezvous, then lie up in Bruno till Monday morning. If Jim didn't surface at the hotel by eight on Monday morning, Max should get out any way he could. If Jim did surface, Max's job would be to carry Jim's message to control. The message would be very simple. It might be no more than one word. When he got to London, he should go to control personally and give him the message. If Jim didn't show up, Max should take up life where he left off and deny everything, inside the circus as well as out. So Max dropped Jim off and returned to Bruno. He was sitting over schnapps at a restaurant later that evening when the whole town started rumbling. He asked the waitress what was going on, and she said there'd been a shooting in the woods. Counter-revolutionaries were responsible. He went out of his car, turned on the radio and caught the bulletin from Prague. That was the first he had heard of the general. Jim didn't show up on Monday. Max got to London on Tuesday night. And despite Jim's orders not to, he thought he'd better try and contact control. That was quite damn difficult, he commented. The rumor at Acton said that control was ill and in hospital. He tried to find out what hospital, but couldn't. I go back to Acton. Toby Esterhazy give me hundred pound. Tell me go to hell. Uh, Max, what happened to Jim? Who mended him? How did... Bill Hayden buy him back. Pretty big price, George, Max replied, and held up eight fingers. As he spoke, he counted on his fingers. Pre-Bill, he began, and one finger went down. Also Pre-Bill's wife and her brother, he folded two more fingers. Also Colin, Jury, all dead. That was network aggravate. That was one hand. Now Max began to count off the fingers of the other. Next was Network Plato, 
Rapotin, Colonel Landcrom, Eva Quiglover, and Hanka Bielover, all also dead. That's a damn big price, George, he said, holding up his fingers close to Smiley's face. That's a damn big price for one Englishman with bullet hole. So they shoot Jim from behind. Maybe Jim was running away, what the hell? They put Jim in prison. That's not so good for Jim. For my friends also, not good. Perhaps it wasn't Jim, said Smiley, after a long silence. Perhaps it was someone else who blew the check networks, not Jim. Max was already leaving. What the hell, he asked. Max, said Smiley. Don't worry, George, Max replied. I don't got no one to sell you to. Smiley's next destination was in Fleet Street, a ground floor cellar full of wine barrels. At a corner table sat Jerry Westerby with a very large pink gin. Well, I'll be damned, said Jerry. Who oh, amazing things. What are you doing these days? And he dragged Smiley forcibly onto the seat beside him. What do you have? Smiley ordered a Bloody Mary. It isn't complete coincidence, Jerry, Smiley confessed. There was a slight pause between them, which Jerry was suddenly concerned to fill. Haven't seen many of the boys and girls for a while, matter of fact. <laughs> Guess they've put me on the shelf as well. I can't blame them. Too much booze. They think I'll blab, crack up. I burned your letter as soon as I'd read it. Smiley went on, in a quiet, unbothered voice. In case you wondered, I didn't tell anybody about it at all. It came too late, anyway. It was all over. At this, Jerry's complexion turned a deep scarlet. So it wasn't the letter you wrote me that put them off you, Smiley continued, in the same very gentle voice. If that's what you were thinking... And, after all, you did drop it into me by hand. Uh, very decent of you, Jerry muttered. Thanks. Shouldn't have written it. Talking out of school. Nonsense, Smiley said. You did it for the good of the service. Jerry expelled some breath and a lot of cigarette smoke. The last job was a year ago, he recalled with a new airiness. Dumping some little package in Budapest, then on to Prague. It was in Prague that I heard the story, the one I wrote to you about. And Jerry was launched after his initial reluctance upon his story concerning one Jim Ellis, the story which Toby Esterhazy had refused to let him print. It was a year ago, well, December, a restaurant in Prague. I always kept near to the ground when I went there. So, anyway... That night in the bar of the restaurant, there was this young boy with an army haircut and a pretty girl on his arm. <laughs> Amazing what people will tell you if it gives them a chance of showing off their languages, said Jerry. This boy spoke English. He asked me whether I'd like to know the truth about Jim Ellis. Oh, pretended I'd never heard of him, explained Jerry to Smiley. Love to, I said. Who's Jim Ellis when he's at home? And this boy looks at me as if I'm daft and says, A British spy. No one else heard, all over the laughing and talking. British spy, he tells me. Fought with Czech partisans in the war. Came here calling himself Hajek and was shot by the Russian secret police. So I just shrugged and said, News to me, old boy. Not pushing, you see. Mustn't be pushy ever. Scares them all. You're absolutely right, said Smiley, wholeheartedly. The boy said he was a conscript, that he'd had to serve in the army or he couldn't go to university. In October, he'd been on basic training manoeuvres in the forest near Bruno. The exercise was supposed to last three weeks, but on the third day it was called off for no reason, and the troops were ordered back to town. Within hours, every sort of rumour was flying around, they broke camp, packed the lorries, and got moving. They'd gone about half a mile when a convoy was ordered off the road. It was the Russians. 
They were coming from the direction of Bruno, and they were in a very big hurry. So, that was the first part of the story, said Jerry. Czech troops out, Russian troops in. Back in Bruno, they were given new orders. Their convoy was joined up with another, and the next night, for eight or ten hours, they tore around the countryside with no apparent destination. Back in Bruno again, the boy heard an explanation. The Russians were after a British spy called Hajek. He'd been spying on the research station and tried to kidnap a general, and the Russians had shot him. You see what the rumours were about, George, said Jerry. The Russians moved in on Friday. They didn't shoot Hajek until Saturday. The Russians were waiting for him to turn up, knew he was coming, knew the lot. Bad story, you see. Bad for our reputation. See what I mean? So you told all to Toby, said Smiley lightly. What was his reaction? Well, that was just it, said Jerry. The thing that had bothered me, the thing that made me write to you, George. First of all, Toby clapped me on the back and congratulated me. Then he went back to the shop and next morning he threw the book at me. I expect you wondered who he'd been talking to in between, said Smiley sympathetically. What did he say exactly? Told me it was most likely a put-up ploy, said Jerry. Boy was a provocateur. Disruption job to make the circus chase its own tail. Tore my ears off at disseminating half-baked rumours. Illogical, I thought it was. Bloke like that. Hot one minute and cold the next. Not his best performance. Know what I mean? With his left hand, Jerry rubbed the side of his head, like a schoolboy pretending to think. Okie dokie, I said. Forget it. I'll write it up for the paper. Uh, not the part about the Russians getting there first. The other part. Dirty work in the forest. If it isn't good enough for the circus, I'll write it up for the paper. Then he went up the wall again. Next day, someone rings control, saying, Keep Westerby off the Ellis story. But by then you'd written to me, Smiley reminded him. Jerry Westerby blushed terribly. Uh, sorry about that, he said. Just that I thought old Tobe was going a bit haywire. I shouldn't have done it, should I? Against the rules. As they parted, Smiley took him gently by the arm. If Toby should get in touch with you, I think it better if you don't tell him we met today. Wouldn't dream of it, said Jerry. And if he does get in touch in the next few days, Smiley went on, you could even warn me, actually, then I can back you up. Don't ring me, but come to think of it. Ring this number. And handing Jerry a card, they parted. The third of Smiley's three visits was to Sam Collins. Hello, Sam, said Smiley as they shook hands. Long time no see, said Sam with a twinkle in his voice. We are reopening the case, Sam. What's this we, oh boy, asked Sam. I, myself, and me, replied Smiley with Lacon pushing and the minister pulling. And the record's been filleted, Smiley elaborated. It's a matter of going to people and asking what they remember. There's almost nothing on the file at all. Sam told his story plainly and precisely, simply remembering the details as facts. He had just come back from abroad, checked in and cleared himself when he was ordered to Control's room. It was October the 19th, the Thursday. You were in Berlin, said Sam. Yes, that's true, Smiley said simply. Control sent me there. I hunted around for Bill, said Sam. But no luck. Control simply said he wanted me to do weekend switchboard duty. He needed someone good on the switchboard in case it was a crisis. He said he'd give me the rest of the story on Saturday. Meanwhile, I was to tell no one. On Saturday, Sam checked in and Control told him a little more. Control said someone was doing a special job for him. 
it was of great importance to the service. Even when it was all over, Sam must never breathe a word of it to anyone, not even to Smiley, or Bill, or Bland, or anyone. If anything came in, a signal, a phone call, however trivial it seemed, Sam was to wait until the coast was clear, and whip upstairs and hand it to control personally. So Sam took up his post on the switchboard. The first call came from the Foreign Office resident Clark. The Reuters head man in London had just called him with the story of a shooting near Bruno, Czechoslovakia. A British spy had been shot by Russian security forces and there was a hunt for his accomplices. So I went to control with the message, said Sam. I said I'd need a brief and did he want me to deny it? I got no answer. Eventually, control says, Find Smiley. And so I asked him, what about the operation? It's deniable, he says. Both men had foreign documents. No one could know they were British at this stage. So then I told him that they were only talking about one man, and that you were in Berlin. And then there was another two minutes silence, till he says, anyone will do. Makes no difference. I should have been sorry for him, I suppose. But just then I couldn't raise much sympathy. I was having to hold the baby and I didn't know a damn thing. I went back to the duty room and switched off all the lines while I tried to get my bearings. The monitor said that Prague Radio was promising an emergency bulletin concerning an act of gross provocation by a Western power, an infringement of Czechoslovakia's sovereignty and an outrage against freedom-loving people of all nations. I rang Bywater Street, of course. Then I made a signal to Berlin telling them to fly you back by yesterday. I'm, I'm sorry, Smiley interrupted. Rang Bywater Street. What for? In case you'd come back early from Berlin. I spoke to Anne. I asked for you and she said you were still over in Germany. Then I asked whether by any chance she knew where Bill Hayden was. Somebody once told me they were cousins. Oh, yes, they are, said Smiley. What did she say? She gave me a shirty no and rang off. Sorry about that, George. War's war. At half past twelve that night, the Czech bulletin came through. A British spy named Jim Ellis, travelling on false Czech papers and assisted by Czech counter-revolutionaries, had attempted to kidnap an unnamed Czech general in the forest near Bruno. Ellis had been shot. I looked up Ellis in the work name index and found Jim Prido, and I thought, just as Control must have thought, if Jim is shot and has Czech papers, how the hell do they know his work name, and how do they know he's British? Then Bill Hayden arrived, white as a sheet. He said he'd picked up the story on the ticker tape at his club, he turned straight round and came to the circus. That was uh, 1.15 a.m. Which is late, isn't it, for reading club ticker tapes? Smiley asked with a vague frown. Not my world, old boy, said Sam. He arrived knowing there'd been a god-awful shooting party, and that was about all. But when I told him it was Jim who'd been shot, he looked at me like a madman. Wouldn't he have known already from the ticker tape? Smiley asked in a small voice. Sam shrugged it off and said that was about the sum of his part in the events, and he had gone abroad for two months. Smiley said, Did anyone question you again afterwards about control, for instance? Not till I got back, said Sam. You were out on your ear by then, and control was ill in hospital. Percy was acting head boy. He called for me and wanted to know what communication I'd had with Control. I stuck to my story, and Percy called me a liar. There was a pause. Then Smiley said, Sam, listen. Bill was making love to Anne that night. You phoned her, and she said Bill wasn't there. As soon as she'd rung off, she pushed Bill out of bed, and he turned up at the circus an hour later, knowing only that there'd been a shooting in Checo. That's what happened, Sam, isn't it? Sam gave a grudging nod. Smiley went on. But you didn't tell Anne about Checo when you phoned her. 
No, replied Sam. Bill stopped at his club on the way to the circus. If it was opened, returned Smiley. Very well, then. Why didn't he know that Jim Prido had been shot? With that question hanging in the air, Smiley and Sam parted. Bill Roach returned to Thursgood School after a cello lesson on the far side of the village with deliberate slowness in order to be late for Wednesday's evensong. He passed the dip where Jim's light was showing. Standing in his usual place, Roach watched Jim's shadow move slowly across the curtained window. Then the caravan door opened and closed, and Jim was standing on the vegetable patch with a spade in his hand. In great perplexity, Roach wondered what on earth he should be wanting to dig for in the dark. Jim lifted the spade and began to dig fast. Roach counted twelve times. Quickly stooping, Jim drew a package from the ground, which he at once smothered in the folds of his duffel coat. Seconds later, and much faster than seemed possible, the caravan door slammed and Jim was gone. In the boldest moment of his life, Bill Roach tiptoed to within three feet of the poorly curtained window, using the slope to give himself the height he needed to look in. Jim stood at the table. On the bunk beside him lay a heap of exercise books, a vodka bottle and an empty glass. He must have dumped them there to make space for the package on the table. The package was about a foot long. Pulling it open, Jim drew out what seemed to be a monkey wrench wrapped in sacking. But who would bury a monkey wrench? The screws or bolts were in a separate envelope. He spilled them on the table and examined each in turn. Not screws, thought Roach. Pen tops. Not pen tops either. And not a monkey wrench. Roach began running. He had no thought for where he was heading. All his awareness was behind him, fixed on the black revolver, on the pen tops that turned to bullets as Jim threaded them methodically into the chamber. His lined face tipped towards the lamplight, pale and slightly squinting in the dazzle. Later that same Wednesday, after his three visits, Smiley sat with Lacon and the minister in the trim front room of the semi-detached Tudor residence of Inspector Mendel in Mitcham, while their host stood upstairs watching the approaches. Smiley was talking. First, I suppose, you should damp down whatever recent negotiations you've been having with the Americans. If the mole exists, it's not only the circus which will double its profits by the American deal. Moscow Center too will, because they'll get from the mole whatever you buy from the Americans. Shortly, the minister left. Lakin stayed behind. You asked me to look for anything on Predo, he announced at last. Well, I find that we do have a few papers on him after all. He was cleared absolutely, you understand. Not a shadow. However, some tiny, odd inflection in his voice caused Smiley to glance at him. I think it might interest you all the same. Some small murmur about his time at Oxford. We're all entitled to be a bit pink at that age. Indeed, yes, said Smiley. Predo and Hayden were really very close indeed, you know, Lacon confessed. I hadn't realized. He was suddenly in a great hurry to leave. Delving in his briefcase, he hauled out a large, plain envelope, thrust it into Smiley's hand, and went off to the prouder world of Whitehall leaving Mr. Barraclough to return to the Hotel Isla and his reading of Operation Testify. That night, alone in bed at the hotel, but unable to sleep, Smiley took up the file which Lakin had given him in Mendel's house. It dated from the late fifties, when the circus was being pressed to take a hard look at the loyalty of its staff. Smiley turned the yellow pages impatiently. The tutors of both men aver that it is inconceivable that the relationship between Bill Hayden and Jim Prido was more than purely friendly. Hayden's evidence was never called. 
Jim's tutor speaks of him as intellectually omnivorous after long starvation, dismisses any suggestion that he was pink. In Jim Prido's world, Thursday had gone along like any other, except that sometime in the small hours of the morning, the wound in his shoulder started leaking. He soaked some lint in Hibitane, flung it across his back and secured it there, then lay face down on the bunk with a large glass of vodka handy. The pain eased, and a drowsiness came over him. But he knew if he gave way, he would sleep all day. So he took the vodka bottle to the window and sat correcting French papers till Thursday's dawn came up over the dip. At 6.30 he dressed and walked quietly down to the church. There he knelt a moment in the centre aisle and groped cautiously under a pew until his fingers discovered the line of several pieces of adhesive tape and following these, a casing of cold metal. In the common room later that morning, Jim went through another routine of the sort he had followed in the church. It was the mail check. A simple enough notion, but it worked. If the opposition is watching you, it's certain to be watching your mail. So what do you do? Every week, from the same post box, at the same time, you post a letter to yourself, and a letter to an innocent party at the same address. If your letter turns up later than the other fellow's, then someone is watching you. The two letters that day happened, clocked in together. After school, Bill Roach approached Jim, wanting his attention. Hello there, Bill. What's your headache this time? Uh, sir, uh, please, sir. Come on, Bill. Out with it. Sir, there's someone asking where you live, said Roach. What sort of someone, Bill? He asked at the village, sir. He said he was a friend. I was in the shop. I heard. Then he got back into his car. It's parked in the churchyard, sir. He's just sitting in it. Jim felt calm, almost easy. For days he had known there was someone. But that also was part of his routine, to watch the places where the watchers asked. Jim went outside into the dark, cold air. The car was parked in the shadow of the church, close in under the elms. For a moment, Jim hesitated. It would take him three minutes, less, to untape the gun from underneath the pew. But instinct advised him, no. So he set course directly for the car, singing, Hey, little, little, as loud as his tuneless voice would carry. Smiley and Jim drove for twenty minutes. Jim took the wheel. When they parked, they were on a hilltop. Scattered lights reached into the distance. Jim sat still as iron, right shoulder high and hands hung down, gazing through the misted windscreen at the shadow of the hills. Smiley coaxed Jim into talking, and by a mixture of instinct and deduction, actually fed Jim his own story. For your first briefing by control, Smiley suggested. I suppose you made a rendezvous outside the circus. No one else was present. And I suppose control cautioned you. Told me not to trust anyone, Jim replied. First we discussed deniability. Control said if I were caught, I was to keep him out of it. All through the briefing I could feel his resistance to telling me anything. He didn't want me to know, but he wanted me well briefed. I've had an offer of service, Control says. A highly placed Czech official, a general of artillery named Stevchek, cover name Testify. Control said that he was one of the very few Czechs the Russians trusted. Stevchek had conveyed to Control, through an intermediary whom Control had personally interviewed in Austria, his desire to talk to a ranking officer of the circus on matters of mutual interest. On Friday, October the 20th, Stevchek would be inspecting the weapons research station near Bruno. From there, he would be visiting a hunting lodge for the weekend, alone. He would be willing to receive an emissary there on the evening of Saturday the 21st. 
he would also supply an escort from Bruno. Did the control tell you what you were to expect in the way of information? Smiley asked. Control had this bee in his bonnet. Stevchek would provide the answer, the key. What Stevchek wanted to tell us was the name of Moscow Center's mole inside the circus. It might be only one word, Smiley thought, remembering what Max had said. In the end, he knew that was all it would be. A name for the mole Gerald, like a scream in the dark. It's one of the top five, Control tells me. He gave me a drink and we sat there making up a code like a pair of schoolboys. We used Tinker Taylor. Alaline was Tinker, Hayden was Taylor, Bland was Soldier, and Toby Esterhazy was Poor Man. We dropped Sailor because it rhymed. You were Beggar Man, Jim said. Was I now? mused Smiley. And how did you take to it, Jim? To Control's theory. Did you believe it? No. Why not? Rationally, we always accepted it would happen, sooner or later. We've turned enough members of other outfits after all. What's so special about the British, all of a sudden? Sensing Jim's antagonism, Smiley opened the door and let the cold air pour in. How about a stroll, he suggested. With movement, as Smiley anticipated, Jim found a new fluency of speech. First, Jim described the recruitment of Max and the maneuvers he went through in order to disguise his mission from the rest of the circus. He flew to Paris, switched to his check papers in the name of Hajek, and landed at Prague on the Saturday morning. As he travelled to Bruno by train, Jim knew he was being followed. He guessed that the Hajek identity was blown and that a trap was primed for him. Still, as long as they didn't know he'd flushed them. Jim had the edge over his followers. He finally managed to shake them and made the fallback meeting with Max to the minute. Here he described his dialogue with Max and said they nearly had a standing fight. Smiley asked, did it never occur to you to drop the job? After all, you knew you'd been followed. Had you perhaps changed your mind about the mission? Or you wanted to know who the mole was, for instance. I'm only speculating, Jim. Jim retorted angrily. What the hell does my motive matter in a damn mess like this? After a sullen pause, Jim returned to his narrative, telling of his rendezvous with the parked car. The driver asked whether he had a gun, and Jim said no, which was not true. As they drove, he told Jim the details. When they reached the lodge, there would be no lights. The general would be inside. If there was a light, then the driver would go in first and Jim would wait in the car. Otherwise, Jim should go in alone and the driver would do the waiting. After they had gone some distance, the driver cut the engine without warning. They had not quite come to a halt when the driver reached for the handbrake. Jim seized his chance and smashed the driver's head against the window and took his gun. They were at the opening of a side path. Thirty yards down this path lay a wooden hut. There was no sign of life. Jim told the day's driver to wear his hat and coat and take the walk for him. He should explain to the general that Jim was indulging in an elementary precaution. Then he should report back to Jim that all was well, or not, as the case may be. The driver began his walk. He had nearly reached the hut when the whole area was floodlit. Then a number of things happened at once. Jim didn't see everything because he was busy turning the car. But he saw four men fall out of the trees, and one of them sandbagged the driver. Shooting started, but none of the four paid it any attention. They were standing back while somebody took photographs. The shooting seemed to be directed at the clear sky. It was all very theatrical with flares exploding as Jim raced the car down the track. He was almost clear when from the woods to his right someone opened up with machine gun fire at close quarters. The car careered into a snow-filled ditch. Jim knew he'd been hit twice in the right shoulder. A klaxon sounded and an ambulance rolled up. 
a whole mock battle was taking place. Yet the ambulance men stood gazing at him without a care in the world. As he was losing consciousness, he heard another car arrive, and men's voices, and more photographs being taken, this time of Jim. Jim came round in a prison hospital with high barred windows and three men watching him. The thing that was strongest in his memory was the plan of campaign he formed while he waited for the first interrogation to begin. His first concession would be the Stefcek story, since they had it already. After a fight, he would tell them he was a British spy and give his work name, Ellis. In accordance with his understanding with control, he would describe the operation as his own show, mounted without the consent of his superiors, and he would bury, as deep inside him as they could go, all thoughts of a spy inside the circus. His second line of defense would be to tell them about Max. By then, Max would be safely out of the country anyway. After that, he would fall back on exposing recent scalp hunter operations, circus gossip, anything, to make his interrogators think he was broken. And that was all he had. And all this would be the smokescreen to disguise what seemed to Jim to be his most vulnerable intelligence, the identity of the members of the check end of the Aggravate and Plato networks. So that's the joke, said Jim with no humor whatsoever. They couldn't have cared less about the networks. They knew damn well that Testify wasn't my private brainchild. They knew all about Control's trip to Vienna. They began exactly where I wanted to end, with Control briefing me on Testify. All they wanted to talk about was Control's theory about a mole. So, said Smiley, I suppose you were beginning to think Control was right but there was a mole. The Russian interrogation was intense. It wasn't that Jim broke exactly. He just ran out of invention. He couldn't think up any more stories to keep them off the truth. At this point, the interrogators who'd been working on him went away, and he was left with a couple of guards and one frosty, stiff-backed little fellow who seemed to be in charge of the whole thing. So you told him about Tinker Taylor, Smiley suggested. Yes, Jim agreed, he did. He told him that Control believed Stefcek could identify the mole in the circus. He told him about the Tinker Taylor code and who each one was. What was this little fellow's reaction, Smiley asked. He thought for a bit, Jim replied. Then he offered me a cigarette. Dreadful American brand, Camel. Did he smoke one himself? Smiley continued quietly. Jim gave a short nod. Like a bloody chimney, he said. Use a lighter with an inscription on it. To George, with all my love, Anne. Said it was yours. But did he mention how he came by it? Jim's answer came out like an army order. He reckoned that after Bill Hayden's fling with her, she might care to redraft the inscription. Jim swung away towards the car. I told him, George, he shouted furiously. Go to bloody hell. If you had one Bill Hayden in your outfit, you could call it set and match. That was well said, Smiley remarked at last and suggested Jim went over the details of his reception in England. After a few days in the circus training centre at Sarat, Jim was visited by Toby Esterhazy, ostensibly to shake him by the hand and wish him luck, but in fact to tell him how things stood. Esterhazy told him that the circus had very nearly gone under as a result of testify, and that currently Jim was the circus's number one leper. Control was out of the game, and a reorganization was going on. Then he told me not to worry about my special brief, said Jim. He said a few people knew the real story, and it was all being taken care of. All the facts were known. Then he gave me a thousand pounds to add to my gratuity. Did he mention Control's theory about Centre's spy inside the circus? Smiley asked. 
The facts were known, Jim repeated, glaring. He ordered me to approach no one, just to forget the whole thing. Behave as if it never happened. Jim was shouting at this point. And that's what I've been doing, obeying orders and forgetting. Yes, replied Smiley. I did a bit of forgetting, too. So Toby actually mentioned Tinker Taylor to you. However did he get hold of that story, unless... And no word from Bill, he went on. Not even a postcard. Bill was abroad, Jim said curtly. Who told you that? Toby, replied Jim. So you never saw Bill since testify. You never saw your oldest, dearest friend. Well, I know Toby said you were considered out of bounds to the rest of the service, but Bill was never much of a one for regulation, was he? said Smiley, in a tone of reminiscence. And you were never one to see him straight, Jim barked. With Jim locked in a furious silence, they returned to the car. That same Thursday night, Peter Gwillem was driving Ricky Tarr west towards Liverpool. It was a tedious journey. For most of it, Tarr boasted about the rewards he would claim and the promotion once he had carried out his mission. When you get to Dublin, don't hang about either, Gwillem snapped. You have to take the first plane to Paris. We've been through all that, said Tarr and yawned. Well, I'm going through it all again, Gwillem retorted. What's McElvoy's work name? Christ's sake, Tar breathed and gave it. Back in London Friday morning, Gwillem telephoned Toby Esterhazy, inviting him for a friendly chat later that day. It was almost four o'clock in the afternoon when Gwillem arrived at the flat in Kensington, where he'd arranged to meet Toby. Safe houses I have known, thought Gwillem, as he surveyed the gloomy flat. He was crossing the hall when the house bell rang, exactly on time. He lifted the phone and heard Toby's distorted voice in the earpiece. How are we? said Willem cheerfully, letting him in. Fine, actually, Peter, said Toby, pulling off his coat and gloves. So we are expecting a pole, he said, sitting down. A pole who you think might run courier for us. He's due here any minute, said Gwillem. Do we know him? I had my people look up the name, but they found no trace. Gwillem was about to make some kind of answer, when to his relief the front doorbell rang and Fawn took up his place in the doorway. Sorry about this, Toby, said Smiley, a little out of breath from the stairs. Turning him to the wall, Gwillem lifted Toby's unresisting hands and put them against it, then searched him for a gun, taking his time. Toby had none. Did he come alone? Gwillem asked. Or is there some little friend waiting down the road? Looked all clear to me, said Fawn. Smiley was at the window, gazing down into the street. Just a shadow, I suppose, he said with a grunt, and turned back to Esterhazy. I want to put a thesis to you, Toby, a notion about what's going on. May I? Esther Hazy didn't move an eyelash. Let's pretend it's two years ago, Toby, said Smiley. Percy Allerline once controlled job, but he has no standing in the circus. Control is seen to that. Control is sick and past his prime, but Percy can't dislodge him. Remember that time? Esther Hazy gave a neat nod. One day, Smiley continued, Percy's door opens and somebody walks in. We'll call him Gerald. He tells Percy he's stumbled on a major Russian source, and it could be a gold mine. It could be the richest source the circus has had in years. Why come to me, Percy asks. And Gerald replies that he would like Percy to act as a sort of father figure to handle Whitehall and the committees, while Gerald handles Source Merlin. One day, Gerald produces his first sample, 
and of course it's very good. Naval stuff, actually, which couldn't suit Percy better, because he's very well in at the Admiralty. So Percy gives his naval friends a sneak preview and a water at the mouth. As to the identity of the source, well, that's a big, big mystery at this stage, but so it should be. Smiley broke off and moved to the window. He had parted the curtain an inch and was staring into the square. Toby? Yes, George. Did you bring a babysitter? No. Why should I bring babysitters if I'm just going to meet Peter and a poor Pole? Smiley returned to his chair. Merlin as a source, he resumed. Where was I? Yes. Well, conveniently, Merlin just wasn't one source, was he? As little by little, Gerald explained to Percy and the others he had drawn into the magic circle. And they want money. In that respect, secret services and their customers are like anybody else, I'm afraid. They value most what costs most. And Merlin costs a fortune. The more you pay for it, the less inclined you are to doubt it. Silly, but there you are. Then one day, Gerald admits to Percy that the Merlin Caucus has a London end. It's the start of a very, very clever knot. According to Gerald, a member of the Soviet embassy here in London is actually ready and able to act as Merlin's London representative. We'll call this Soviet official... Polyakov, shall we? I didn't hear anything, said Esther Hazy. I've gone deaf. Some of Merlin's best material is smuggled to London by diplomatic bag, continued Smiley. All Polyakov has to do is slit open the envelopes and pass them to Gerald, or whomever Gerald nominates. You, Percy, Bill Hayden, and Roy Bland. You four of a magic circle. Right? Now let's speculate how the London End works in detail. There's a house, isn't there? Who meets him there, Toby? Who handles Polyakov? Esther Hazy made no reply. It's my guess that everyone takes turns, said Smiley, answering his own question. But tell me, Toby, is Ivlov a name to you? Esther Hazy nodded. Who said Connie Sachs had to be pushed downhill, Toby? Look, George, he replied. I think it was Percy, okay? Or maybe Bill, Toby shrugged. Maybe it was Roy, huh? So you take orders from all three, said Smiley lightly. That's very indiscriminate of you, Toby. You should know better. Who told you to cool off Max, Toby? Was it the same three? Only I have to report this to Lakin, you see. He seems to have the minister on his back. Esther Hazy didn't like that at all. This was the first indication that Smiley was acting in an official capacity. George, you've been talking to the wrong guys, he said quickly. Oh, one of us has, Smiley agreed pleasantly. They also want to know about Westerby and who put the muzzle on him. Was it the same person who sent you down to Sarratt with a thousand pounds for Jim Prido? It's only facts I'm after, Toby, not scalps. Anyway, who's to say you're not a very loyal fellow? It's just a question of who you are loyal to. Who gave you the message for Jim about Tinker Taylor? Did you have it straight from Polyakov? Was that it? For God's sake, Willem whispered, let me sweat the bastard. Smiley ignored him. Esther Hayes's eyes were on Smiley all the time. He's like a dog, thought Willem. He doesn't know whether to expect a kick or a bone. Come on, George, Toby said. You know how these setups work. We buy Polyakov, okay? He's got to pretend to his people that he's spying on us. Or how else can he get away with it? So we give him chicken feed. So who is Polyakov's agent inside the circus? Smiley asked simply. 
This question, Willem saw, mattered very much to Smiley. He had played the whole long hand in order to arrive at it. As Gwilym waited, he realized that he too was beginning to understand the shape of Carla's clever knot, as Smiley had called it, and of his own grueling interview with Alaline earlier that week. Good heavens, Toby, resumed Smiley. Don't be obtuse. You said it yourself. If Polyakov's cover for meeting you people is that he's spying on the circus, then he must have a circus spy, mustn't he? So who is he? Polyakov can't come back from the circus loaded with your chicken feed and tell his lot at the embassy that he got it from the boys. There has to be a story. It's his lifeline, so it's got to be convincing. Who is he, Toby? Smiley inquired pleasantly. That's my thesis, you see, Toby. Gerald is a Russian mole run by Carla and he's pulled the circus inside out. Esther Hazy looked slightly ill. George, listen, he said. If you're wrong, I don't want to be wrong too, get me? But if he's right, you want to be right, Willem suggested in a rare interruption. Look, said Toby, I do what they tell me, okay? They say, act the stooge for Polyakov. I act for him. Pass him this film. I pass it. I'm in a very dangerous situation, he explained. Where's the safe house you keep exclusively for Polyakov? Smiley asked. Five lock gardens, Camden Town, Toby replied. There's a caretaker, Mrs. McCraig. She keeps house and mans the recording instruments. Very well, said Smiley. Oh, there's one last thing I want you to do, Toby. I want you to ring her and tell her I'm staying the night, and I'll want to use the equipment. Tell her I've been called in on a special job, and she's to do whatever I ask. Tell her I'll be round about nine. Toby made the call and fixed Smiley's visit. If he's any trouble, Willem said to Fawn with real venom as they left, bind him hand and foot. In the stairwell, Smiley, lightly touched Willem's arm. Peter, I want you to watch my back. Will you do that for me? Give me a couple of minutes, then pick me up at the corner of Marlowe's Road, heading north. Willem waited, then began to follow the steadily plodding figure of George Smiley, the very prototype of the home-going Londoner. As Willem watched, Smiley pulled up abruptly and stepped perilously into the road, disappearing into the door of an off-license on the other side. As he did so, Willem saw, or thought he saw, a tall, crooked figure step out after him. But at that moment a bus pulled up, screening both Smiley and his pursuer. Willem trailed Smiley for a short while longer, and only once did he have the suspicion that there was a third figure walking with them, a fanged lopsided shadow, thrown against the brickwork of an empty street. But when Willem started forward, it was gone. When Ricky Tarr arrived in Paris, he made straight for Steve McElvore at the residency. He made his introduction with a gun jammed against McElvore's ribcage and a promise that he would use it if McElvore tried any monkey business. He needed to send a message to Alaline, he said. It would be personal and decipher yourself. Tar would like Steve to work the machine for him while Tar stood off with the gun. Then they would wait together for a reply from Alaline. In Cambridge Circus, the lighting was quite yellow. Mendel had installed himself by a telephone at the window on the third floor of a clothes shop. It was nearly midnight, and he had been standing there three hours. Through his binoculars, Mendel once more studied the building straight across the road from him. At night, everyone uses the front door, Gwillem had said. Shortly before eleven, just an hour ago, a cab had arrived, coming from the direction of Foyles. Mendel had never seen Alaline, but he had their description of him, and as he watched him through the glasses, 
you recognized him without a doubt. Looks like Tinker's arrived, Mendel said, down the mouthpiece to Smiley, who was waiting in the safe house in Lock Gardens. How did he look? Smiley murmured. Busy, said Mendel. So you should be, Smiley returned. At this point, a second cab drew up, and a tall, slow figure cautiously climbed out. Here's your tailor, Mendel murmured into the telephone. Hold on. Here's soldier boy, too. Proper gathering of the clans by the look of it. All we need to know now is who comes out. In the drawing room of number five, Lock Gardens, Smiley sat in an armchair with a telephone receiver pressed to his ear. On the canal towpath at the back of the house, Gwillem maintained a vigil of the house. As soon as he'd received Mendel's message, Smiley carefully rested the receiver on the arm of the chair and cleared his line of retreat to the scullery. The house was in total darkness, and Smiley felt his way carefully. From the scullery, he flashed his pen torch through a chink in the curtains and waited for Gwillem's signal in reply. From now on, they could only wait. In Paris, Ricky Tarr tossed the incoming telegram to McElvoy. Come on, he said. Earn your pay, unbutton it. It's personal for you, McElvoy objected. Look, personal from Allerline to you. I'm not allowed to touch it. Do as I ask, said Tarr. For ten minutes, no word passed between the two men. Tar was standing across the room, very nervous from waiting. Read it aloud, Tar said, when McElvoy had finished decoding. McElvoy began to read. Personal for Tar from Allerline. I require positive clarification or trade samples before meeting your request. Quote, information vital to safeguarding of the service, unquote. Does not qualify. McElvoy had not quite finished before Tar interrupted. That's the way, Percy boy, he cried. Yes, repeat, no. Do you know why he's stalling, Steve? He's sizing me up to shoot me right in the bloody back, just like he did with my rusky girl. And he laughed in a strange, excited way. Alone in the darkness of the drawing room, Smiley changed the telephone to his left side while he drew the gun from the wallet pocket of his jacket. Hello, said Mendel suddenly. I'm here, said Smiley. Somebody has just come out of the circus, said Mendel. Front door, but I can't be certain of the identification. Must have ordered a cab to the door and stepped straight into it. He was heading north, your way. Smiley looked at his watch. Give him ten minutes, he thought. I'm ringing off, said Smiley. Cheers said Mendel. On the towpath, Gwillem read three long flashes from Smiley's torch. The mole is on his way. Smiley waited in the scullery, polishing his spectacles because the heat of his face kept misting them. The mole arrives first, he thought. The mole plays host. That is protocol part of the pretense that Polyakov is Gerald's agent. Then Smiley heard the taxi arrive. He heard the tread of one pair of feet on the gravel, brisk and vigorous. They stopped. Obviously the mole was patting his pockets, looking for his key. A nervous man would have had his key in his hand all the way here, but not the mole. The front door opened and someone stepped into the house. Smiley heard the door close, heard the light switches snap, and saw a pale line appear under the kitchen door. Then a second taxi pulled up. Again the front door opened and closed. The strip of light under the kitchen door grew suddenly brighter as the drawing room lights across the hall were switched on. An extraordinary stillness descended over the house. Then Smiley heard voices. At first they were indistinct. They must still be at the far end of the room, he thought. Now Polyakov came nearer. He was at the trolley, pouring drinks. 
What is our cover story, in case we are disturbed? Polyakov asked in good English. From the further end of the room still, a muffled murmur answered the question. Smiley could make nothing of it. What will you drink? asked Polyakov. There was a pause. Scotch, said Hayden. A bloody great big one. With a feeling of utter disbelief, Smiley listened to the familiar voice reading aloud the very telegram which Smiley himself had drafted for Tar's use only 48 hours before. He knew, of course. He had always known it was Bill, just as Control had known, and Lacon in Mendel's house, just as Connie and Jim had known, and Alaline and Esther Hazy. All of them had tacitly shared that unexpressed half-knowledge, which, like an illness, they hoped would go away. And Anne? Did Anne know? With gun in hand, Smiley tiptoed to the window and signaled to Willem. Having waited long enough to read the acknowledgement, Smiley returned to his listening post. Willem raced down the canal towpath. Lacon was standing at the corner of the road, He's there. Gerald's arrived, Gwillem whispered. I won't have bloodshed, Lacon warned. I want absolute calm. Gwillem didn't bother to reply. Thirty yards down the road, Mendel was waiting for him. As Gwillem and Mendel reached the house, Gwillem glanced back over his shoulder. He thought for a moment he saw a crooked figure watching them from a shadow of a doorway across the road from them but on second glance he could see nothing. Gwillem inserted Toby Esterhazy's key and pushed open the door. At the drawing room door he listened, long enough for the fury to break in him at last. Hayden, once his confessor. Hayden, always good for a laugh. Hayden, the model on which he'd built his life. With all his force, Gwillem shoved open the door and sprang inside, gun in hand. Hayden and Polyakov, Gwillem recognized him from photographs, were seated either side of a small table. Hayden had not even taken the pipe from his mouth before Gwillem had him by the collar. With a single heave, he lifted him straight out of his chair. He had thrown away his gun and was hurling Hayden from side to side, shaking him, shouting. Then suddenly, there seemed no point. After all, it was only Bill and they had done a lot together. He heard Smiley, polite as ever, ask, Bill and Colonel Viktorov, as he called them, to raise their hands and place them on their heads. There was no one out there, was there, that you noticed? Smiley asked Gwillem. Quiet as the grave, said Mendel, answering for both of them. For the next two days, George Smiley lived in limbo. He rose late, potted round the house in his dressing gown, and cooked himself meals he never had. Once Lakem called with a request from the minister that Smiley should stand by to act as night watchman at the circus till a replacement for Percy Alleline could be found. Replying vaguely, Smiley again prevailed on Lakem to take extreme care of Hayden's physical safety, while he was at Sarat. Aren't you being a little dramatic? Lakon retorted. The only place he can go is Russia. We're sending him there anyway. On the third day, Lakon called again. Smiley was to go to Sarat. Hayden insisted on seeing him. The understanding was that if Smiley would act as confessor, Hayden would give a limited account of himself. At Sarat, Smiley found Hayden in a Nissen hut, hidden among the trees. Cheer up, said Smiley. You'll be out of here soon. Their first conversation was halting and banal. Would Smiley please forward the mail from his club, and tell Alaline to get a move on with a horse trading with Carla? They walked in the grounds, and Smiley established with something close to despair that the perimeter was not even patrolled anymore, either by night or day. 
After one circuit, Hayden asked to go back to the hut, where he began to read his prepared statement. At Oxford, he said, he was genuinely of the right, and in the war, it scarcely mattered where one stood as long as one was fighting Germans. He had often wondered which side he would be on if the test ever did come. After prolonged reflection, he had finally to admit that if either monolith had to win the day, he would prefer it to be the East. From then on, he said, it was only a matter of time before he put his efforts where his convictions lay. That was the first day's take. They agreed to meet tomorrow at the same time. Early next morning, Smiley was back at Sarah to find Hayden in a festive mood. He had been told that the exchanges were agreed, and he should expect to travel tomorrow or the next day. In that same spirit of good fellowship, Hayden then entered into what Smiley had called the details, though he declined to discuss any part of his lifelong association with Carla. Operation Witchcraft, said Hayden, was conceived primarily to take care of the succession, to put Alaline next to the throne and hasten control's demise. Witchcraft also placed Hayden virtually out of control's reach and gave him a cast-iron cover story for meeting Polyakov whenever he wished. Operation Testify was rather a desperate throw. Hayden was certain that control was getting very warm indeed. Was uh, Stevchek's original offer genuine, by the way? asked Smiley. Good Lord, no, said Hayden, actually shocked. It was a fix from the start. Stevchek existed, of course, but he never made an offer to anyone. Obviously, we needed to be sure control would rise to the bait and who we would send. Since we made it Czech, he'd have to choose a Czech speaker. Tell me, asked Smiley, did Jim come to see you before he left on that testify mission? For a long while, Hayden hesitated, then did not answer. But the answer was written all the same in the sudden emptying of his eyes, in the shadow of guilt that crossed his thin face. He came to warn you, Smiley thought, because he loved you. Jim was watching your back for you right to the end. Before he left, Smiley asked the one question he still cared about. I'll have to break it to Anne. Is there anything particular you want me to pass on to her? Oh, Anne, said Hayden, as if there were a lot of Anne's around. It was Carla's idea, he explained. Carla had long recognized that Smiley represented the biggest threat to the mole, and Smiley had this one prize, Anne. Carla reckoned that if Bill was known to be Anne's lover, Smiley wouldn't see very straight when it came to other things. On the night of Testify, there had been a small hitch. If everything had gone according to plan, Hayden would have had a chance to read his club ticker tape after Sam Collins had rung Anne, but there was a fumble at the check end, and the bulletin was released after his club had closed. Hearing that, Smiley had had enough, so he slipped out not bothering to say goodbye. Returning to London, Smiley couldn't face Bywater Street, so he went to a cinema, dined somewhere, and got home at midnight, slightly drunk, to find both Lakin and the minister on the doorstep. They drove to Sarat at top speed, and there, in the open, sat Bill Hayden on a garden bench facing the moonlit cricket field. His eyes were open, and his head was propped unnaturally to one side, like the head of a bird when its neck has been expertly broken. There was no dispute about what had happened. Hayden had been unable to sleep and had proposed a walk round the grounds. No one had thought to accompany him. After half an hour, the senior guard went to look for him and found him like this. The guard thought he was asleep, but, bending over him, caught the smell of vodka, 
which surprised him, since Sarat was officially dry. It wasn't until he tried to lift him that his head flopped over, and the rest of him followed as a dead weight. Had Hayden received any messages during the day? Smiley asked. No, but his suit had come back from the cleaners. Perhaps there was a message in that, for a rendezvous, for instance. So the Russians did it, said the minister. Bloody thugs. No, said Smiley. They take pride in getting their people back. Then who the hell did? Everyone waited on Smiley's answer, but none came.